Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Sue. Uh, Grateful member of the Al-Anon family groups because today I love an alcoholic, and that wasn't always true. That's why I ended up in Al-Anon. My recovery date is May the 11th, 1976, and uh, we want to thank Marvin and uh, James and Britt and the committee, whoever else is responsible for us being here. And, uh, you know, Keith shared in the AA meeting last night, and you could tell by the way he shared he needed help with relationships. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm here to help him. So... And uh, a lot of you need help in relationships like we do, huh? So who's here that's not in a relationship that wants one? There, a guy back there. He must be a newcomer. So you girls look at back there. <laughs> and he's here getting ready. So it's a good deal starting right off the bat for him. Uh, yeah, we'll go through this uh, today today. Um, talking about our relationship, by the time we get through, you're going to know everything about us. We have no secrets. Uh, our serenity is attached to our secrets. We have none. And so serenity is very important to us. Uh, I'm not an alcoholic. I couldn't uh, drink and keep up with Keith. I tried. If we kicked everybody out of al that had drank and used with an alcoholic, we wouldn't have membership. So... Uh, you know, I qualify for the program of al but it was very important to me when I first got here to understand why it said in the first step, I'm powerless over alcohol. My life's unmanageable because I did not know uh, why alcohol. I'm powerless over the alcoholic. I tried to change him. I tried to do things for him. I tried to tell him what to do right and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he wouldn't pay any attention to me. And... Uh, and it confused me. I didn't know. And I believe that most of our actions before we get here is based on ignorance. And uh, so I was told by the long-timers in this program to read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and learn all I could about the disease of alcoholism. And what I got to find out in that big book is that there's a phenomena of craving in the alcoholic. It's an allergy of the body and uh, a compulsion of the mind. And I did not have that allergy. I could drink, and when I'd have enough, I could quit. And I needed to know that the person that I loved could not do that. Once he had a drink, because I'd hear, you know, the first drink gets him drunk. No, it was like the 12th or 15th drink got him drunk. But I didn't know that once he started drinking, he couldn't quit. And as a non-alcoholic, that was very important for me to know. Because I wasn't raised in alcoholism, I knew nothing about it. Um, I came from like a so-called normal home. And when I got to meetings, they would say, once you're attracted to the alcoholic personality, you'll always be attracted to the alcoholic personality. And I very smugly thought, so what's a lady like me doing in a place like this? And... uh, because I'd never had been attracted to an alcoholic personality. And I did a lot of inventory work after I got here of why did I belong in this place? What qualified me? Uh, Why did God take me to an alcoholic? Why did that show up in my life if I had no interest in that at all ever and knew nothing about it? And uh, what I got to find out is that when I met the alcoholic, there was a lot of excitement and a lot of unpredictability, and I loved that. And I immediately became addicted to that, the excitement of the alcoholic personality. So what I understand today is that when I get obsessed with the alcoholic, that is my drink of choice. I get drunk in the head when I get obsessed with another person because obsessiveness is my biggest character defect. So, um, and I believe that once uh, 
alcoholics get sober, we're all the same. You know, it's, um, we all have the same character defects. I just don't have the phenomena of craving. And I have an obsession, an obsessive mind in uh, all of the character defects that go with it, that I try to fix me with outside things instead of looking for a God in my life. So when I got here, uh, I was a very mean and angry lady, and I didn't know why. And uh, I wasn't raised like that. I came from a very loving family. My family, I had an older sister and a younger brother. My dad worked in the oil fields. We lived in a trailer house. We, uh, uh, we followed oil rigs all around Oklahoma and Texas Panhandle and western Kansas for years. I went five, six, seven schools in one year. And uh, I never felt like I belonged anywhere. And yet uh, my mother used to tell me, you know, nobody's better than you, but you're not better than anybody else, you know, to help me hold my head up. You know, last night's meeting was on ego. I had to come to Al-Anon to find an ego because I'd been beat down. I thought I knew everything. I had a lot of smug and arrogance and self-righteousness. But my self-worth was way low because of the disease of alcoholism, because of the way I'd been raised prior to being called oil field trash all my life. And so I had characteristics that uh, once I met the disease of alcoholism, they just blossomed like crazy. You know, it's, um, you know I'm the kind of person that, uh, you know, like this lady, she go, gets off work one day from work, and she goes to a bar and thinks, well, I'll, before I go home and fix dinner, I want to relax and stuff, so I'll just go in and have one drink, and then I'll go fix dinner and, and uh, rest for the evening after a hard day's work. And she goes in this bar, and she sits down at the end of the bar, and this cowboy comes in and he flops down a hundred dollar bill on the bar and he tells the bartender he said i want a bottle of jack daniels and don't let it go dry and the bartender said well it looks like you're going to really hang on a drunk and he said i am i just got out of prison and the bartender said oh my gosh what are you in there for he said um killing my wife bartender said okay so he walks off go get a bottle of jack daniels and this little gal scoots down on the bar stool next to the cowboy she goes so i hear you're single and uh, <laughs> that's the kind of person i am <laughs> it's like no problem here and uh, i went through a lot of stuff growing up looking for answers in all the wrong places um when i was a young teenager my dad passed away with cancer and that left my my sister got married, and I left my mother, my younger brother, and I at home. And uh, my mother started dating. I resented her for that because she's been disloyal to my father because I'd always been daddy's little girl. And uh, I started rebelling to her and looking for love in all the wrong places. And I ended up in San Antonio, Texas, looking for, uh, you know, I was in an unwed mother's home. I'd look for love in all the wrong places, ended up pregnant. At that age, and back then, you didn't keep a child, and uh, I was sent off to this home. And I stayed there for a period of time, gave a child up for adoption, and I went back. And uh, and I didn't like the people I was running with. My mom said to me one night, she was going to a honky-tonk. She said, you want to go with me and my friends? And I said, sure. And so I walked in. Oh, my gosh. It was smoky and rowdy and uh People were fighting, and they were dancing. The music was loud, and it's like, yeah, I'm home. I loved everything about the atmosphere, everything. And I watched this cowboy move the room, and everywhere he went, something was happening, and it was a fight, and I thought it took a lot of courage for him to do that. And uh, he had started this fight. He came running past me, and he said, honey, let me know when the fight's over. And he ran in the woman's restroom to hide. And uh, like a good potential al I stood there on duty. And so when the fight was over, I said, Cowboy, you can come out now. And he came out, and he asked me for the last dance. And uh, I'll never forget it. The last dance was usually a slow dance where you rub up against each other and get ready to go home. But, uh, this was a fast dance, and it kept getting faster and faster and faster, and we didn't miss a lick. And what I understand about that today is that he got me downtown in the fast lane right now. And um, 
he came, uh, he called me, asked me out. My mom said, no, you're not going out with him. He's older than you. He's been married before, and he's in trouble all the time. And I said, I don't care. And so he came to pick me up for a date. We go outside. There's no car. I said, wait a minute. My date's picked me up in cars. And he said, well, you don't understand. I've lost my driver's license. And uh, I wrecked my car. And I said, no problem. And uh, I got got him in my car, and I knew what to do. I took him to the drive-in movie, and you sit at the movie, and you kiss and smooch and steam up the windows. And we sit there, and we watch the movie. And I remember thinking, this must be what it's like to be with a more mature man. And then I noticed that he had a six-pack beer between his legs, that he was more interested in me, and that set up that obsession in me. I wanted to be number one in that man's life, and I would go to any lengths in the next 15, 16 years. It almost killed me doing that. He wouldn't mind, and I'd do all kinds of things to him uh, to make him pay attention to me. And he'd get angry at me, and I'd hit him, and he'd hit me back, and we'd have those fights. And we were just dating. And uh, I'd go home, and I'd have a black eye, and my mom would say, what do you do to that man to make him treat you like that? And I'd say, what do I do to him? Look what he just did to me. You know, not taking responsibility for my own actions. And that's what I found during uh, the process of my recovery in this program is that... uh, one of the things that they read, that they just read before the meeting is working with others. And in working with others, what Keith and I are trying to try to do today is share with you what we do to better our relationship. The tools that we use in this program that gets us compatible to have some compassion for each other in our relationship because we come from a place where we had none. It was all selfish, self-centered, do-it-my-way type stuff. And that is the biggest problem with relationships with the disease of alcoholism is thinking of somebody else. And what I found out in the process of this recovery and working with others is that... uh, In doing inventories, if I don't look, like I was taught to do an inventory by the four columns in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and if I don't look at that fourth column, what part I played, like first column's resentment, the second column is the cause, the third column is how it made me feel, and then the fourth column is what part did I play, where was I selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, all that kind of stuff. If I do not look at that fourth column, I will not recover. And I will not change. And there are consequences for every action I take. And that seems to me in being able to receive fifth steps from ladies that I've sponsored, uh, that that's the problem. We don't want to look at our part. We do not want to look at the consequences. I don't know how many fifth steps I've done and say, what were you doing Before this happened, where were you? And when people start answering those questions, they find out that the problem was the consequences of their actions. That's why bad things happen to us. Is because we try to force our will on others. Instead of saying, what do you think? Well... Instead of keep paying attention to me and making out in the car, jerking the car keys out of the car and throwing them out in the vacant lot and making him go look for it does not make him passionate when we're dating. (laughs) Him coming over to watch TV with me and passing out on the sofa when he's passed out, which I thought he was falling asleep on me, and he had long hair and a long beard, and I shaved half his head and half his face off when he woke up did not make him passionate. (laughs) <laughs> and he went around like that for two weeks. And I thought he was cute as hell because he would say, everybody in this town thinks I'm two-faced anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and I did things like that because I wanted his attention. And the things that I did to get his attention were things that pushed him away from me. 
and made him irritable, restless, and discontent toward me, rejecting me. And then I'd have to do something else to get his attention. You know, I did things for him. Why isn't he doing things for me? Like go to jail. I'll go to jail. You know, we went up to uh, Kansas one time to a honky tonk and we were um, we had a fight up there and uh, we're driving home and he, you know, who's going to drive home? He wins. He gets in the car behind the wheel and we're going 100 miles an hour across the Oklahoma Panhandle back to Texas where we came from. And when we go through radar at the state line, he said, my God, if they ever catch me, I'll never see the sun again. And I said, no problem. And I switched places with him going 100 miles an hour in that car. And there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not drunk. And when we get the other end of the state line, they come up the car. They had a roadblock there. And and, uh, when we got stopped, they said, you weren't under the wheel when we Check this car out a while ago. We don't know how you got under this wheel, but we've checked it out, and it's been reported stolen, and so we're taking you in. And Keith smart off the cop, and, and they put him in the sheriff's car and told me to follow him 40 miles to the county seat so they could arrest me. So I did, and I'm doing that kind of stuff for him. He's not doing nothing for me, I think. Yeah. And so it's like, when's my turn? When's he going to pay attention to me? But it was because I would start all of these scenarios. You know, like being a honky-tonk, he's not paying attention to me. Flirt with another guy so he'll pay attention to me. You know, I rouse suspicion and jealousy and all those kind of things. That's not loyalty. That's not love. And so as the disease of alcoholism progressed in our life, the relationship problems got worse. We couldn't communicate. And, uh, you know, we uh, ended up getting married, and uh, he got a draft notice. And uh, we got married, and he didn't pass his physical, so Uncle Sam let me keep him. And uh, we moved to Stillwater, Oklahoma, and he enrolled in school. And and he'd gone to many schools, never got in a degree, but I knew that I had what it took to make him stay put. If he would just stay in one school, he could get a degree and finish school. And I would tell myself how important I was that I could do all these things. And uh, because alcoholism was starting to tell me, you're not worth anything, you're a piece of you-know-what, and, and the alcoholism in me started believing that kind of stuff. That's where relationships go when there's no recovery. That's where relationships go when there's alcoholism involved. Yeah, and after we moved to Stillwater, not very long after that, we had our daughter, Simone. And I can remember when they handed her to me saying, thank God she's a girl. Because Keith was a drunk, his dad was a drunk, and his granddad was a town drunk. And it's like, I didn't know alcoholism doesn't care what sex, color, race, or creed you are. It'll take you to the gates of insanity and hell, and you don't even have to drink booze to get there. And I understand today that this is a deadly disease. Not just for the alcoholic, but for me too, for the non-drinker. We had a lady in our group, um, in my home group in California, uh, three years ago. And she came to Al-Anon. He didn't get sober, and she didn't need Al-Anon anymore. And uh, him and her had a fight, and she remembered that... uh, She'd heard in meetings that when you have a fight and you you can't stop it, just walk away, get out of there. And she went and got in her car and uh, to leave, and he jumped on one of the kids' bicycle, and he he rode the bicycle in front of her car when she stopped at the stoplight, the corner by their place. And uh, she saw him in front of her, and she floorboarded that car and ran over him and looked in the rearview mirror, and he was still flopping back there. And she put it in reverse and drove over him again. She drove over him three times. She said, I just wanted it to stop. And she's doing time for murder. She wasn't drunk. She's not an alcoholic. It's a deadly disease, and I understand that rage. I understand that rage. You know, it's, um, you know I've had a, an Al-Anon panel in a woman's prison for 27 years. And uh, there's women in there that are just like me. They're not alcoholics or addicts. You know, I uh, two inmates shared in there one night, and uh, 
One was an alcoholic and one was a non-alcoholic. And they were both in there doing murder life terms. One had gotten drunk and got even and the other one got even and hadn't drank at all. And they were both in there for the same reason. And uh, I understand the rage, the blind rage that you can get into and you can't stop it. You know, my daughter, when Keith and I would fight and he'd be done and walk away from me because I'd get in his face and shake that finger and if you do that again and he'd say, get out of my face. And uh, I'd take one step closer and uh, he'd hit me in the knockdown drag out fight would be on. And when he was done and wanted to walk away, I'd turn around and Simone would be standing there and I'd take the rest of that rage out on her. It's a family disease. And uh, I took a lot of my anger out on that girl. And so when we got into recovery, the steps are so important because our family has healed through the steps of this program. And it's, uh, it's the steps to put relationships back together. When I got to the program of al after hitting the bottom, and I believe that all non-alcoholics have to hit a bottom just like every alcoholic does. And... Uh, When I hit a bottom and I finally surrendered and the guy that 12-stepped Keith came to our house and he said, you need help. And I said, no, I don't. If he just quits drinking, I'll be fine. He said, no, you won't. And uh, he said, you are the most foul-mouthed, angry woman I've ever met in my life. And he told Simone, if you love your daddy, you'll go to a program called Alateen. And I started going to the program of Al-Anon. She started going to Alateen. And... uh, When I got in there, I understood. I felt good. I felt safe. I felt relief. I didn't feel shameful anymore because everybody in there was talking about the same thing that I felt. And they answered all my questions before I asked. So I understand today that in order to build a relationship, I had to come to the program of Al-Anon first. In, uh, In the very beginning... Uh, my higher power was my home group. I got a sponsor. And then my higher power was my sponsor. And then as my sponsor took me through the steps, it transferred that dependency from the home group to the sponsor to a God of my own understanding. And that's what those steps do for us. And they teach us about relationships. I had to develop a relationship with a room, my home group, and I develop a relationship of trust with a sponsor before I could ever have trust in my relationship with my daughter or my husband. And, uh, and that's why we come here. We come to the program to learn what not to do, to get rid of all those old ideas, throw them out the window, unlearn. I had to unlearn everything that I thought was good. And then I had to get all these new ideas out of... Uh, the 12 and 12, and uh, out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and out of the al literature. You know, I uh, was taught to read all my books in the morning when I first get up and, uh, and say the third and the seventh step prayer, any other prayers I want to, and look in the mirror and say, good morning, Sue, I love you, because the self-esteem was not there. And I did that this morning. I looked in this morning and said, God, you look good. Yeah. And uh, it felt good. It felt good, yeah. And as going through those steps, um, what I found out is in the fifth step, the fifth step has 12 rules in there for building a relationship. And, and I want to go over that with you as we go through the steps. So Keith and I are going to go through the steps and the traditions and um, um, hit on the literature and any other thing that we can share with you that has helped us and still helps us because we're not done. Uh, People that graduate from this program end up drunk and insane. And uh, I don't ever want to graduate. I want to stay here with the sick ones that are trying to get better. Yeah. And, uh, And it feels better and I identify here. Practice these principles in all of my affairs. And uh, and this program puts families back together. Keith and I and Simone are one of the few families 
And we know of Sissy's here. It's good to see Sissy, her family recovered with this program. Our family has recovered as a family in this program together. And uh, very few do that. Very few make it. And people say, well, I want my husband this, I want my husband that. The key is, is that you, I had to be in a relationship with someone who wanted to be in the relationship. Both parties have to want this thing. And I was so sick and so insane and so hungry for answers when I finally surrendered and got to this program that I didn't care what Keith did. And isn't that the way this program works? Once we surrender and we give up and we don't need it anymore, that's when we get it. And we start getting back what we give away. I remember telling my sponsor in the very beginning, he never gives me compliments. She goes, do you ever compliment him? Well, no, he's a guy. He has feelings like you. Give him compliments. And then I remember calling her one day and said, I know I've given him at least 100 compliments and I haven't gotten one yet. She said, just keep giving it away and one day you'll get it back. And I do. I do. And, uh, you know, many times we'll go, you know, I was taught to uh, go to at least three Al-Anon meetings a week and I still do that, usually more, because I like who I am after I, when I'm in a meeting and after I've been to a meeting. And I was taught to go at least one open AA speaker meeting a week so I could hear other alcoholics share so I'd know I didn't live with the only crazy sucker in town. And uh, that's still our pattern today. And uh, last Thursday night we went to a, an open AA speaker meeting together. It was a large meeting in Las Vegas. And uh, when we got home, he said, you were the best looking lady in the room. You know, how neat, how neat. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I believe it. I believe it because I feel good about me today. And it's like I don't have to look at you today to size you up and judge you to see if I feel okay. Happiness is an inside job I found out in this program. And as long as I'm happy with me, you're fine. You're fine. Keith's fine. Simone's fine. And so I had to build all of these answers with me in this program. You know, one of the things that everybody goes, oh, we got to be together. We've got to do this together. We've got to do that together. And he's stuck right here on my hip. And if I'm going to be here, he better be here, blah, blah, blah. And uh, what I've come to understand, Keith and I are not connected at the hip. And he goes to his meetings, and I go to my meetings, and when we get home, we have something to share. I remember when I was new in the program, I always liked musicals. And I never went to them because Keith didn't like them. And so after I got in the program, my sponsor said, he doesn't have to like them. You can go anyway. Yeah. And so I decided to go to a musical in L.A. with... Um, some al friends. And so I was getting all dressed up one day and getting ready to go to L.A. where it's going to go over and we're going to have dinner and we're going to go to this musical at the Pantages Theater. And, oh, my God, that was big stuff to me. And Keith walks in, and he's all dressed up as a biker, and he's going for a bike ride. And I look in the mirror, he's standing there beside me, and I've got on this nice dress and pumps, and, and he's dressed like a biker and a bandana and And I'm thinking, what's a lady like me doing with a jerk like this? (laughs) And it dawned on me, because that's the man I love. That's the man I love. That's why I'm with him. It's not his outsides either. We love the person inside. And the thing that I love about this program that I've been taught with from long-timers is that... uh, you know, a lot of alcoholics make fun of Aldons, and uh, Keith never has, and I really respect him for that. And he's always uh, supported me and the ladies that I sponsor, and uh, and our daughter, and support the ladies that she sponsors. At uh, 
You know, you run across areas where AA does not respect the Al-Anon program. And I want to thank you for allowing me to participate in your program this week, uh, this weekend. Uh, obviously not that way here because we're all human. You know, we've all been affected by the disease of alcoholism. But it's like I was taught by the long-timers that Al-Anons are the only ones that never gave up on the alcoholic. Everybody else rejects them. Get rid of them. Throw the bum out, all that kind of stuff. And uh, we hang in there because we see the insides. And it's like when I used to want to throw him away and I'd leave him, we'd take turns leaving each other. It was like there was a person in there that I cared about, that I loved, you know. And I'd leave and Simone and I'd leave and we'd run away and we'd be gone for about three days and I'd call him at work and I'd say, can I call you every once in a while? You're my very best friend. And he'd say, damn it, Sue, come home. And we'd go home, we'd make up, and everything would be fine until the next drunk. And, uh, and I thought, what is it? What is it about me? What am I attracted to? And I don't think there's anything more loving than an alcoholic. And when Keith was new, I remember watching him hug a newcomer. And I went, oh, my God. He cares about somebody else. And I fell in love with him. Because any alcoholic does not want to give away anything. And he started giving of himself to newcomers. And it made me fall in love with him. And uh, what I understand today is that, you know, it's like the story of the man that was going to uh, put in a new lawn. And he had an optimistic son and a pessimistic son. And uh, the pessimistic son, he had had a load of fertilizer delivered. And the pessimistic son said, Dad, what are you doing? That stinks like crazy. You know, let's wait. I don't understand what you're doing. And the dad said, it's fertilizer, son. He said, I'm going to spread that all over the yard, and there's going to be a nice yard, and we'll have a, a beautiful lawn. And the kid said, I don't care. It stinks. I can't handle this, you know. And he looks out the window, and his optimistic son's out there just digging like crazy. And he goes out there, and he goes, son, what are you doing? And the kid says, daddy, with this much horse shit, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. And it's like, that's what I look for. That's what I stayed for. It was the pony that was on the inside. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the monster came out a lot, and toward the end it came out more often. But what I got to recognize in my fourth step is that it came out in me. It came out in me. I could not, no longer, after I did a, a four-column inventory, blame the alcoholic for all the bad things. I wasn't a victim anymore. And my sponsor said, there are no victims. There's volunteers. And uh, and I tried the al blueprint for progress, and it didn't work. And I tried an autobiography. It didn't work. And she took me the big book, the four-column inventory. And, uh, and I did that, and I got to take everybody else's inventory at the very beginning, what, who it was, what they did, and how they made me feel. And, God, it was great. And my sponsor said, be as petty as you can with all of that stuff. And I was. And I got the fourth column, and I said, I don't understand. I can't do this. It doesn't feel right. I don't know what part I played. And she said, you get on your knees and you ask God to put the words in that pencil that you need to see. And so I did. And I remember getting up off that floor and I started writing. And it was like a video in front of me. I could see myself in Keith's face saying, blah, 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 blah. I could hear him saying, get out of my face, sir, or I'm going to hit you. And I would take one step closer, and the knockdown drug out fight was on. And it's like, oh, my God, it was me. It was me. He told me he didn't want to do that, and I wouldn't quit. And my obsession and the blindness of I can fix this no matter what, I believe, was just as strong as his drive for alcohol. And what I've learned in this program is that uh, obsession and love can't live in the same vessel. You know, when I'm obsessed with something, uh, love's out the window. And so I have to give up and surrender and uh, accept 
you know, resentments, uh, you know, expectations or premeditated resentments. I can have no expectations. It got me in trouble all the time. We've gone through surrenders in this program in uh, yeah, 10 years. We had a huge surrender in this program. The feds came after Keith for being involved in organized crime for over 20 years, and I went nuts. I went nuts. He'd been sober for 10 years, and he's involved with organized crime. That means he's done this for 10 years in recovery. That's not recovery in my head, and I'm judging. And I went crazy, and I went to my sponsor's house. (laughs) And at that time, the sponsor I had lived in Covina off of the 10 freeway in California. And... uh, And I'm going down the freeway, and I'm screaming, and I'm yelling at God, what do you think you're doing? We've been in recovery for 10 years. This is not supposed to be happening to us. And I look up, and I'm in in Pasadena, and I'm like, how did I get here? 10 years in recovery. And so I get off the freeway, and I turn around, and I go back the other direction, and I end up in Pomona. Covina's in the middle of those two places. And I'm thinking, where did Covina go? I am so crazy. And I finally pulled over and uh, tried to calm myself down, tried to say the serenity prayer, tried to say the third step prayer. And then I finally got to my sponsor's house. And uh, when I rang the doorbell, her sober alcoholic husband answered the door. And he said, oh, my God, Sue, what's wrong? Let me give you a hug. And I said, get away from me. You're an alcoholic. And they took me in their house, and they set me on the couch, and my sponsor came. She sat on the other end of the couch, and she'd reach over and pat me, and she'd say, it's okay. It's going to be okay. She was scared to death of me because I was right back in that blind rage because I hadn't gotten my way. I wasn't going according to my expectations. And I was crazier than hell. And when I get crazy, the anger comes back. And people get afraid of me. I am not a nice person when recovery is not the center in my focus. And uh, she told me that night, if you have expectations, everything in your life will have to fail you in order for you to get closer to your God. She said, uh, Keith failed you. That's what got you to Al-Anon. That's what got him to Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, there was a time that you thought that uh, Al-Anon had failed you. And you found out that you were going through menopause. It wasn't Al-Anon at all. You had expectations. And she said, now you think that Alcoholics Anonymous has failed you, and it has not. Keith's sober. He has not drank. And she said, you've had expectations. Everything in your life will fail you in order for you to get closer to your God. And if you can get through this, we'll do an inventory. You'll write about it. We'll look at the fourth column. And you're going to take actions and you're going to get busy again in service. And uh, I did all that. And uh, it started getting better. And I was asked to uh, speak at a convention up in Canada. And on Sunday mornings, they had a big breakfast out in the pines. In, uh, and they let people from, guys from this prison come. And there was this huge Indian guy that he came from prison. And he seemed like he was as tall as those trees. And he talked about freedom. And he was a lifer in that prison. But every year they let those inmates out to go to that breakfast for that AA convention. And they always called on him, and he always shared on freedom, and I heard it. Freedom is an inside job. And I accepted the fact that as long as my husband is sober, he has freedom. And as long as I allow him to do what he's got to do in Alcoholics Anonymous, he has freedom, and so do I. And I went back home and I told Keith, I said, you know, I think I understand what's going on. And the feds are after you and you got to go to these hearings. 
And if you have to do time, it's okay. God has a purpose for you in that prison. I have accepted that. Because <laughs> screw you, you aren't looking at the time. <laughs> but the point was is that I got in acceptance. And then whatever Keith and his sponsor and AA did with him was fine with me. And uh, And his sponsor worked with him to get him through that. But it was so funny because... Every time we would get in the car to go somewhere, Keith was turning on this tape of a guy called Norm A. And he was listening to Norm, because Norm used to talk about being involved with the guys downtown, downtown. And we understood what he meant. And Norm had been gone. He'd passed away two years before that. He was actually 12-stepping my husband from the grave. And I thought, oh, my gosh, if Norm can still help Keith, Betty, his wife's bound to be able to help me. And so I called Betty, and I said, Betty, I need help. I'm in trouble. And I told her what was going on, and she said, Sue, I want to tell you something. She said, Alcoholics Anonymous is going to help Keith. You can't help him get through that. Stay sober. And that's what you're worried about. You're worried about his sobriety. And that's none of your business. It's up to Alcoholics Anonymous. What your business is, is that that's a man that you love, that you're married to. He's your husband. And you've made a commitment to him to be his wife. Now, he's going through this, and he's going to go down in every area. You better keep him alive in the bedroom, or you're going to lose him. Because he'll go down... And he'll reach out for anything to make himself feel better. And she said, I want you to make a commitment to me to keep that man alive in the bedroom. And I did. And uh, and it worked. And there was nights that Keith would say, no, I don't think so. And I didn't take it personal because I knew that he was in a place that he wasn't feeling good about himself and it wasn't important. And there was times that it was great and we had a good time. And I kept that man encouraged in that area. And I'd gone to an AA lady that had uh, 22 years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, been an ex-hooker. And I said, Ann, I want to learn everything you can teach me about sex. And she did. (laughs) And I told Keith that I'd done that, spent two hours with her. And he said, babe, I'm so proud of you for reaching out. (laughs) And we got through that, and he was released from that. And uh, I used to say, yeah, you used to think you was a free man. You were just loose. Now you're a free man. And they let him go, go with that whole deal, and it made us stronger as a couple. Because we, with you on one hand and God on the other, we can get through anything. We can get through anything. I've gone through the ego inflation with jobs. God, I had my dream job. And they'd sent me to school, and I got my degree. I was in HR, and I was telling everybody what they could do and what they couldn't do. They'd never had an HR department before, and I developed it. And I was uh, negotiating union contracts, and Keith belonged to a union in his job, and I'd go home and tell him what he could do and what he couldn't do, and he'd go, wait a minute, you are not on the clock anymore. And uh, they shut that company down. My ego had to be smashed. 400 people lost their jobs because my ego had to be smashed. And I used to think, God, that's kind of drastic. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, and during that period of time that I was off work, uh, God, I was on my knees so much I had rug burns. And uh, and I finally, one night, I was in a step study meeting and we was on the third step. And it talks about the dependency in that third step has to be on God. In the AA 12 and 12, it talks about dependency 19 times. And that I can have no dependencies on anything but a God of my own understanding. And when I get that dependency on God, my independence is my greatest asset. And those are the kind of things that I've learned in the recovery of this thing. And how important it is that uh, my focus stays where it's supposed to be. Or the disease comes back all the time. And... Uh, 
And after being off work for three months, another division of that same company, once I'd surrendered, okay, God, whatever you want, because my ego was so great. I'd go on interviews. I'd walk in, and there'd be four to ten people in there filling out applications for the same job, and I'd think, I don't need this. And I'd turn around and walk out, and I'd get in the car, and I'd start home, and I'd start crying. What did I just do to myself? Because the ego was so huge. I'm not an alcoholic, but I can get ego inflation going. Just just make me feel important once. I'll eat it up, you know. And it has to be smashed. And the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about the ego has to be smashed. And it has to be done over and over and over again in order for us to practice humility in our life on a daily basis. And I went through that, and after three months, another division of the same company called me, and and they hired me back and reinstated my seniority and 401K and everything. But I had to go through that surrender. And the neat part about that whole thing was is that once I got back into human resources, I had compassion for people that were unemployed. Isn't that great? I had to experience that myself in order to have compassion for people that were going through what I'd gone through. And uh, and it ended up being a great career for me. And uh, I worked for that company for 15 years and then was asked to leave that company. And I got a retirement package, an early retirement package from that company. And uh, I'll forever be grateful. They hired a new manager and... uh, he wanted someone that with a master's degree in there, and I wasn't necessary anymore. And they had to go through a process. For, it took them two and a half years to get rid of me. And I hated it every day. I hated it. And uh, I'd ask my sponsor, what does it mean in the big book? We see spiting all people and all things. What does that mean? I can't rat her out. I can't call corporate and rat her out. And I kept my mouth shut, and my sponsor had me write a two-page letter of all of my accomplishments with that company and send it to corporate because I'd never had a review. Um, I'd helped that company make millions of dollars. We'd won lawsuits, a sexual harassment lawsuit because of all the documentation that I'd done on that whole situation. Stress cases, a driver's uh, walkout. I worked for a distribution company. I'd saved that company millions of dollars. And gotten bonuses like crazy, but never got a review. And here I am with a new supervisor, a new boss, and I'm being written up on a regular basis. Don't give that information to the managers. Give it to me, and I'll pass it on to them. And they started, the managers started complaining because they weren't getting their information, and I got blamed for it. And so it was a lot of... uh, stuff like that that I had to walk through. And every morning before I go to work, I'd call my sponsor just to get her encouragement, saying you can do this today, one day at a time. And I had to walk through that every day, and it took two and a half years. And the day that they walked me out, the HR director from corporate came. And uh, she said, the president, uh, we wish you would have called us and talked to us. The president has always liked you, and you're a very valuable employee, but you never said anything to us about what was going on, and they followed procedures, and it's a done deal now. But if you will resign, we have a package for you. And I said, thank you. Thank you. They'd never given a package like that to anybody at my level before. And uh, the HR director said to me, She said, let's go out in the warehouse and get some boxes, and I'll help you pack your stuff. I said, okay, and we got out there. And she said, Sue, I'm so sorry. She said, I wish you had called me. And I gave her a hug, and I said, you know what, Robin, it's okay. This is the way it's meant to be. It's not a problem. I feel good about this. And she started crying, and she said, oh, my God. You're the one that's being walked out. I'm crying, and you're comforting me. I hope someday. I have the dignity that you have as a woman. That is a result of the program. That's a result of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. al doesn't have 12 steps. We got to adapt the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I applied those steps every day to that whole situation. So not only through this 
33 years that we've been in this program has Keith had surrenders in his life, but I have too. Our daughter has had surrenders in the 33 years that she's been in this program. And uh, she has a great life today. She went to Italy to become a model and became a model and fell in love with an Italian and uh, married him, and she's been over there for uh, 22 years. And they have, uh, they get to raise our granddaughters. And what a trip that is. And we talked to Simone on Thursday, and uh, she had some ladies that she sponsors coming over to their house, and they were cooking a dinner, and they were going to have a meeting in her house. She's still active, 33 years in the program, and we got to talk to our granddaughters. And, uh, you know, our oldest one is 10, and uh, she speaks uh, Italian and a little bit of English. And then the two-and-a-half-year-old, uh, she speaks three languages. Her name's Jasmine, and, and she speaks Jasmine and Italian and a little bit of English. And we understand all three languages, Yeah. And what a trip that is to have a family like that. And uh, and it's all a result of these steps. These steps and the traditions can get us through anything. Like in a relationship, the first tradition says our common welfare should come first. That means I have to work on me and I have to get better with me and my God before I can have unity with anybody or anything else. Once I have done that for me, then the unity in my home and the unity in my home group and the unity with you and me is okay. The unity at work is okay. Unity is the key. And I am the only person with the key. You can give me all of the tools you want to, but until I am willing to open that door on the inside and let you in, there is no recovery. So um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with relationships. There's a lot of answers for relationships. There's a lot of surrenders we have to go through. You know what I thought when I first got to this program? I thought that if we surrendered to this program and we got all these tools and all these principles to live by, that our life was just going to be smooth. Well, it's not. But what this program's done for us is it has given us the tools to live with life on life's terms. We go through everything that everybody else in this world goes through, except we can do it with more dignity. You know, it's like last year when they had the fires in California. Those fires, we were evacuated. We were listening to houses two blocks from our house burn down. And it was ugly. It was horrible. And we are the only people in our neighborhood that we know of that are the weird ones. We're the losers. We belong to Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. And one of our neighbors is being called, told Keith one day he was outside and he had a beer. And he said, um, and it's obvious, we're in the program. We got bumper stickers. We have things on our door. We have a sign by our front door that says, we don't dial 911. And it's got a smoking gun and the AA symbol on it. And uh, so it's obvious, you know, we have a place in a piece of um, concrete that has the AA and the al symbol on it. So, you know, if you know anything about the program, you know we're in it. And this guy told, neighbor told Keith one time, he had a beer in his hand. He said, you know, that AA thing might work for you, but it didn't work for me. This still works for me. And Keith's going, good for you, you know. And they were down there one day and they were fighting. And he's telling his wife, she's screaming at him, and he's going, knock it off. Everybody can hear you, yeah? And then you hear this, (laughs) and I started laughing. I knew he'd put his hand over her mouth. (laughs) So anyway, we are the weird ones in the neighborhood. Everybody else is normal, okay? And the minute we heard we was being evacuated, there were five, six Al-Anons and five, ten AAs at our house. And they had the hoses. They were watering down our house. They were watering down the neighbor's houses. 
all the other neighbors just had their family there, throwing stuff in the car, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and it was like we were the only ones that had help and were the weird ones. And it was like, my God, nobody else had that kind of help or love around them, supporting them, getting through that. And it was so cool that when we got back home, we was unpacking and our house didn't get hit. And uh, the gratitude, oh, my God, the gratitude. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the ladies came over and they're helping me put the house back in order and hang back up clothes. And they had said, Sue, what clothes you want? I said, I don't care, just throw stuff in there because I was taking pictures off the walls and, and stuff like that. And, and so we're putting my clothes. They'd thrown clothes in the suitcase and stuff. And so... I'm going, Jesus Christ, you guys, look at the clothes that you put in that suitcase, you know. How did you decide what to take? And they go, oh, we just put the stuff in there that we like to see you in, you know. And it's like if I'd had to gone to a high school or something to stay there for the weekend or the day, I would have been the best dressed person there because my friends helped me, you know. And it's like who has friends like we do? Who has the tools to develop relationships and love like we do? It's available for us. All we got to do is apply these principles to our life. We don't even have to be good. You love us no matter what. And that makes us want to be better people. And so we try harder. We try harder. And it's like, I remember one time... uh, and I'll close with this story, is that um, I was wondering, why can I not drink? Because after Keith got sober and we went through a Christmas and he wanted to kill me because I still drank. It was the first Christmas after his sobriety. And I decided I'm not going to drink anymore. And then he really wanted to kill me because I just, you're not going to drink. How can you not do that, you know? So anyway, I had gone to a HR conference, and uh, I was sitting there, and in the, in the conference, everybody was all dressed up in suits and everything, and they were impressing everybody, and they all knew all the answers, and, you know, and it was like, and I sat in that room, and I thought, Jesus Christ, you know, these people are so arrogant, and, uh, but they know a lot of stuff, and, uh, and I thought, I'll listen, and I'll just uh, I'll absorb a bunch of stuff. And every once in a while, they'd ask me a question or something, and I'd answer it. But I was impressed with all these people. So then they have a dinner for us that night, and uh, we all go to dinner. And all these people ordered cocktails, and they're goofy. They're goofy. They're laughing, and they're acting stupid and stuff. Now, they'd been dressed up in suits and was snobbish and and smart and all that stuff, and now they're drinking and they're goofy. And I'm thinking, these people are probably not alcoholics. Alcohol is doing for them exactly what it's supposed to do. It's a social lubricant. And so it takes away the facade and they can be themselves and they can have fun and enjoy each other. What's wrong with me? I'm not an alcoholic. Why can't I drink? What would happen to me if I took a drink? And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, God, I need to understand this. And it came to me. If I took a drink, and I started drinking with those people, and they'd been dressed up all day, being who they were all day, and now they're goofuses, I'd be saying, you phony, you know what? You are so important and so smug and arrogant today, and now you're such an idiot, you know? And I would be taking inventories. Because it would release all of my inhibitions. That's what it had done for them. That's what it's supposed to do. But they don't have alcoholism. I do. And when I drink, I become that old, mean person that I was when I got here. You see, this program makes me a socially acceptable person because I apply these principles to my life. 
It makes me a person that I like to be around and that you can tolerate being around. And that Keith can live with and love and that Simone can, can love her mother. The mother that you taught me to be, she can love. She couldn't love the mother I was before I came here. And so I know this program works. I know that this program combats alcoholism. It does for us what we can't do for ourselves because it plugs us into a power. And that power is in this room. God uses people to help other people. And we have to have each other in order for me to stay centered, in order for me to stay focused. In the 12th step, God gave me a purpose. Why am I here? Why did God put an alcoholic in my life? Because he wanted me to be of service to him. And I could not do that until I hit a bottom. And I became useful to my God. You see, God uses people to help other people. I was of no use to God or mankind before I got to you. And because of that, I get to be here. I get to love on you guys this weekend. I get to feel your love. I get to be with Keith and be grateful for sobriety for just one more day. It doesn't matter that he's got 33 years. It means he's changed in those 33 years, and I'm grateful for that change and the change in me. But sobriety is one day at a time, and I cannot forget that as a non-alcoholic. Without physical sobriety in our home, there's nothing. But with physical sobriety in our home, there is hope. With physical sobriety with me, emotional sobriety with me in our home, there is hope. And we got it from coming to things like this. Thank you. And uh, what I want to announce now is that uh, Keith is going to do this session of the workshop, and then we will break. Around about 11.30, we're going to try and eat, and we want to come back around 1 o'clock. And then they'll have the rest, and we'll be over around about 3.30. The workshop should be in about 3.30. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it over to Keith. Thanks, Howard, for that beautiful introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Keith. By God's grace, Alcoholics Anonymous, a room full of people like you and a little effort on my own. I'm not taking a drink of alcohol, nor have I used any kind of narcotics since May 11, 1976. And for that, I'm especially grateful. Yeah. Thanks, Alcoholics Anonymous. Very grateful. Uh, Sue and I are doing this uh, set of tapes. Uh, I guess you could say it on on uh, relationships, but it's uh, <clears throat> whatever the taper wants to put on there as a title is what it'll be. But uh, what qualifies us to do this, as you see other tapes and other people and other speakers, is uh, uh, there's certain things that qualify Sue and I to be asked to be uh, to speak. Uh, for one thing, uh, when we came to the program back to over 33 years ago, I'd been in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for a number of years, and uh, there never was any Al-Anon or Alateen or Alley Dog or Alley Cat, nothing. And uh, and I would go to AA, and I'd come home and tell her what was going on in AA, and uh and she didn't care. She figured I was over there honking and sniffing on the women. Uh, even though I couldn't have got a date with a $1,000 bill in each hand, I was so rank. Uh, but then we'd have a fight, and then I'd be drunk again. There was never uh, I was going home to a, a drunk, crazy house, so there was never any recovery. I don't blame that. It was just the way it was. And I can't stay sober in an environment where I drank. The same me will always drink again. 
the same me will always drink again, and there was no change, even though I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, and plus the fact that I'm a real alcoholic. I'm a type 4 alcoholic. I'm a fifth-generation alcoholic. And uh, any time I ever went to Alcoholics Anonymous or to church or to Zen Buddhism or uh, the Masonic Lodge, I had a chemical in me. So for many, many years, I, I was never chemically free. I was never sober. I always had something in me that kept the phenomena of craving uh, going. See, hear people say, I came today and I didn't, I didn't uh, stay sober. Well, you probably never sobered up either. You probably never detoxed. And I never detoxed. I had so much stuff in me for so many years that the phenomena of craving was never lifted. It seemed like I tried, but I always had something in me that, that made the phenomena of craving uh, rejuvenate itself. And uh, so I didn't stay sober. And uh, finally, when I did get sober, they put me in a detox, and they kept me in a detox and detoxed me. Completely detoxed me. Wasn't a treatment center, it was a detox. They lo- throwed me in there and uh, and they gave me nothing but bananas. You need potassium, eat a banana. And uh, people around knew me and seen me come and go and come and go. But I, I detoxed. <clears throat> that detox was a, a brand new detox and uh, Ironically, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And uh, my doctor in that detox was Dr. Paul Oliger, uh, who is uh, in a, uh, the big stories in a big book, Dr. Addict Alcoholic. And he was my doctor. He had start, he was work. He opened him and another doctor opened this detox. The other doctor was named Dr. Zuska, and Dr. Zuska had started and worked in many. Uh, detox units with the armed services, various groups of armed services to help armed service uh, the the military people. He was a non-alcoholic. He loved working with alcoholics and addicts. And he he and Dr. Paul got together and opened a a detox, a 40-bed detox in a St. Joseph's Hospital in uh, Orange, California. And I was the first wave to come in, not not by design. The guy that 12 stepped me couldn't get me in anywhere else. Nobody wanted me. I'd been around and around. And, and these people had just opened this, and I went in. There were 39 of us, 39 people in the first few months of detox. And they slammed me in there, shut the door, and, uh, and I stayed uh, for several months and detoxed. And I don't ever want to detox again. Thank you very much. I just don't want to do that. It's, if there's anything, I remember a lot of experiences of my drinking time, but I remember very vividly my detox, and it was hideous, and it took a long time. It took a long time to be completely detoxed. So I was detoxed. At that same time, Dr. Paul and his wife, Max, who was an Al-Anon, he, I, he was my doctor. I was assigned to him, and, and so he found out about my wife Sue and my daughter Simone and and he encouraged them his wife Max encouraged them to go to Al-Anon and Alateen the guy that 12 stepped me once he got me in the detox went home and 12 stepped my wife and daughter and said you need help you're insane and the kid is like a wounded animal and so what happened they put us uh, in threw us into the program and and uh, Sue went to Al-Anon uh Basically, because she didn't have any other choices. We'd tried everything else. And so it was like she didn't do it for any other reason other than that it was strongly suggested you need help, and she went. She was sweetly reasonable, like me. We were beat down. We ran out of friends and enemies at the same time. I ran out of running room. And uh, and my daughter was so beat down that they... She just went along. Of course, Alateen is part of Al-Anon, and so when Sue went to Al-Anon, my daughter, our daughter went to Alateen, and she didn't like that, but she cried and said, I don't want to go to Alateen, and I said, I don't want to go to AA either, but I'm going and you're going. You don't have a choice. She was 12 and a half, and uh, 
she went. And, and she didn't like it for a year or more. And then one day she was in an out-team meeting, and a little girl came in and all beat down like our daughter. And uh, the little girl asked my daughter to be her sponsor, and she lit up like a Roman candle. Boom! And uh, she was alive with it. And 33 years later, 32 years later, she still is. She sponsors 20 or 30 women, and, and uh, she's a real pioneer. She moved to Italy and started step studies and women's conferences and eating meetings and speaker meetings and just blazed through there and, and has a, a fantastic uh, uh, family and, and, a, and a program family today. So we started out doing this. In the very beginning, in 1976, uh, there were very few families that came to the program together, went to the program together, the AA Allen on and Allen team, together and stayed together. And so we would go to meetings and she would go to al on the kid would go to Alateen, and I'd go to AA. And in the very beginning, you know, and my dog went to Alley Dog and the cat went to Alley Cat. I mean, that's my story. I'm sorry if you had a mess and your family was dead, but mine wasn't. I came here with sick, sick family. Everything. And... uh and so they pushed us in here, and we, we were sweetly reasonable, and we took it. So in the very beginning, I think we had less than six months in the program, and, and we were asked to participate, to, to share our story. The Al-Anon, the Al-Anons uh, uh, in that particular area of Southern California, were, they participated in various conventions and other things, and uh, they would ask our family to speak. At an Al-Anon function, AAs didn't want to hear nothing about. They didn't want to hear nothing from the wife and the kid. They were still guilt-ridden, most of them. But the Al-Anons would say, "We got a family here that's doing something. They're coming in the same car. They're going home in the same car. That's really the message." And so, what would we would go share, and we would go share at these. They'd have potlucks and various things. The Al-Anons would, and they the Al-Anons would drag their old drunk husband and their new new uh, sober alcoholics over there to hear us. And, and I would talk for 50, this was the training that we had. You said, how do you train to do this? You, you need to, if you got 15 men, shut up in 14 and a half. And to get me to shut up in 14 and a half and let my daughter and wife talk, that was a big deal. I'm telling you, people would come up and throw a net over me and jerk me off of here so my wife and daughter could share. And I would talk about what it used to be like, drunk along, because I was new and that's all I knew. And my daughter would talk about what happened, which was the 12-step call on our whole family. And then Sue would talk. She was the al and she didn't have any fear about working the steps. She, fear was a, she didn't know what it was. So she wasn't afraid to do the steps. She blazed right through the steps and all that stuff first. She set the pace. I'm a, I'm a fearful alcoholic once I sober up. I don't know. I can't do that four step if anybody finds out what my four step, they'll lock me up forever. My excuse, I wasn't that big of a deal, but I thought I was. And she blazed through the steps, and so she could talk about steps. So when we shared as a family, at six to eight months in the program, I would talk about all the drunkenness for 15 minutes. My daughter would talk for 10 minutes about what happened when the guy came and 12 stepped us, and she was so beat down, all she had left was her God. And then Sue would talk about the steps. And like any gathering where two or more are gathered, God is within the midst. With the three of us, with Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear, there was always one of us in God consciousness. Always. Always one of us was in God consciousness. So when we shared together, uh, there was hope. And people didn't remember what we said, but they saw us come in the same car and they saw us leave in the same car. In spite of what we said, people said, oh, you better not do that. You, have, you guys haven't done your complete inventory yet. And uh, there's going to be some pain. And there was some pain because I was drunk and loaded and, I, and I'd hear my daughter talk about things. But we didn't intentionally try to hurt each other either. And you people loved us enough that we didn't come to this podium we were taught in the very beginning this podium is to share your story not your opinion or engross 
your idea of what you're supposed to do over everybody else. We come here to share our story, and it's still true. I don't come here to tell you what to do. I come here to tell you what I did. And we were taught that in the very beginning. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, new, brand new, listening to my daughter talk about her God, and she was 12 and a half, 13 years old. And it was like, wow, she really believes in some power greater than herself can help her. Because I had, the alcoholism had stripped everything else away from her. And, and here she has a God. A 13-year-old, a 13-year-old kid. My kid knows more about God and has a better relationship with God with, than me. I'm the alcoholic. I'm supposed to have that. And instead of being angry and jealous, I was amazed. Wow. Wow. And that gave me hope. See? And, uh, and then Sue would talk about the steps, and little by little we go through that. So that was 32 and a half years ago that started happening. So Sue and I have been doing this, and Simone, when she got to be 19, she didn't want to share as an LT anymore. She was an al on and so she, the family sp- split. I mean, Simone wouldn't go talk as an al She was an al on so we, we quit talking as a family. We've done it several times, but she moved to Italy and changed. But Sue and I have been out here on the road doing this stuff for over 30 years, and we've never missed a commitment. We've never been late uh, at a convention because we missed an airplane. There was three years that we talked in every state in the Union plus Canada and Mexico. It got so bad running around talking that uh, I almost got drunk because that's heady wine. I started believing my own crap. And uh, and Sue and I would go out and talk, and then on, on a Sunday on the way home, we couldn't even talk to each other. And we got so tired and sitting on those airplanes, and you get neck cranks and and I was working. I had to go to work. She had to go to work. And finally, uh, Jack Sullivan from Louisville, Kentucky, told me, he said, where does it say in the big book you've got to fly for six hours so that you can have one hour of vicarious pleasure at the podium? And, uh, and I got some strong old-timer influence to, to uh, pay attention to my family, pay attention to my job. <clears throat> it, was, it was insane. Uh, But uh, it was necessary, I guess, because we're here today. And uh, we've had to moderate and learn to do things uh, uh, together. One of the things that I enjoy today, after 33 years in the program, I enjoy doing things with my wife. I support Al-Anon. I'm Al-Anon friendly. I support Al-Anon. And when I do things with my wife, it's part of the amends that I do... uh, for the al for the non-alcoholic, because I'm very uh, supportive and, and realize the help that people need. Plus the fact that uh, Sue and I have a relationship. We've been together 50 years, see, 50 years, and we have a good relationship. And we raised our daughter, and my daughter has forgiven me for all the terrible things that went on and uh, because she recognized and accepted that I was an alcoholic and that I really wasn't that way when I was, got sober, but it was when I was drunk that I acted the way I did. And uh, so there was change. There was change. Uh, there's little God stories along throughout uh, our program years but that gave me, you know, uh, indications and, and uh, points in the road uh, where I could stop and, and see... Uh, when I was uh, uh, sober uh, uh, four, five, six years, our daughter decided to, uh, in there, she just wanted to be a model, and so she, she had a dream, and she was all beat down, and she started, through Alateen, held her head up and started doing things, and she uh, made a decision. She went model around the world and uh, when she's 16, and so she wanted to go to Italy to Milan, Italy, because that's a fashion capital. And she uh, believed there's no spot where God is not. And she believed in herself. And she she was, she was took her obsessiveness. I don't know whether she's an alcoholic or an addict. She doesn't either. She's never picked up. She was young enough to be able to make that decision. She's never picked up. But she's a very obsessive, compulsive person. 
and uh, she focused when she was 13 to 16 on be wanting to be a model. So she didn't have a boyfriend. She didn't do anything. She focused on being a model and finished her high school, and she focused on being a model. And when she was 16, uh, uh, she brought home a contract to go model in the Orient. And uh, I wouldn't sign it because I knew what them guys are going to do to her out there. You know, I... Uh, I'm an alcoholic. I'm afraid. I, I can't distinguish the difference between fear and joy. So she had her mother sign my name, and she went to uh, <clears throat> she went to the Orient and modeled around over there and came home with a portfolio. And then she decided to go to to Italy and model. And uh, we took her down to the airport. She had all these bags. She couldn't even pull them all. She's uh, I don't know what was 18, 17, 18, 19 years old. 19. Well. Somewhere, and she was still my little girl, baby, let me tell you. And when that little girl went down to LX and, and had a one-way ticket to, uh, to Milan, Italy, where she couldn't speak Italian, didn't have a manager, didn't have an agent, didn't know nothing, and I took her down there and, uh, and we dropped her off. Why, I, I knew if there wasn't a God, why, well, I'm in a lot of trouble. And, uh, and she waved by and took off. And she went over there, and she got sick, and it was cold, and she didn't know anybody, and she didn't know how to speak English or Italian. And, and we didn't know. We couldn't hear. We didn't hear from her for, I don't know, a long time, weeks and weeks. Uh, and unbeknownst to me, uh, she finally uh, reached out for help. She asked questions and, and found out. She's trying to find an Allen on me, and she couldn't. And they finally said, well, there's an English-speaking AA meeting over here. And somebody told her where it was, and they got a hold of somebody. And they came over to this room where our daughter was holed up in there with a, the flu or cold or something and, uh, and uh, scared to death. But she reached out to people in the program, and some AAs came and picked her up and took her to a meeting. They, the meeting was, uh, I don't know, 16 people, and it was in a circle. And it was a closed AA meeting, and they brought her there. And... Uh, they went around the room, and, and she was the last to share, and she said, I know this is a closed AA meeting, uh, and I'm an Al-Anon, and I want to thank you for letting me be here. And they, they, weren't so, they weren't so structured. They said, if you can talk program, we'll let you share in here. And she knew how to do it because she came from our family. She knew how to do it at that time. And so she shared in uh, her story a little bit in that meeting. Sitting in that meeting was a young man by the name of Peter who was a who was a model, a photographer, and he'd come from Los Angeles. And he said to my daughter, your dad's name Keith. And she said, yes. He said, I owe him a favor. And he took our daughter and introduced her to people, introduced her to agents, introduced her to, to models, moved her over to a place, a, a facility where models live, and she uh, uh, went to work. He gave her a set of tapes so she could learn the language, and that was over 20-some years ago, and she's still there. And she worked for many years as a model and was very successful, a ramp model, a ramp model. And that guy came home and told us that she was okay. You see, what had happened a few years, a year or two before she went over there, I was kind of like Marvin here. I was kind of the head sick of a thing like this. And there was a bunch of people came, and Peter came to this get-together. And when he left, he left his organizer underneath a chair. And I picked that up, and, and I opened it up, and my daughter and a newcomer was watching me, and I started to steal his money and his credit card. But uh, uh, I had witnesses, so instead I called him, and I went uh, to a meeting and gave it back to him. And he said, oh, man, thank you so much. And uh, if there's anything I can ever do for you, please let me know. And I remember thinking, Peter, you can't even take care of your purse. <laughs> you ain't never going to be able to. You ain't never going to be able to help me. But I didn't say it because I was sober. I just thought it. I didn't say it. And here it is, four, three, two years later, and Peter sitting in a meeting in Milan, Italy, where my daughter is completely lost. And Peter remembered that commitment to me, and because I had changed enough. In the short time I was sober, Simone, our daughter, was she was willing to reach out to people in Alcoholics Anonymous and ask for help. If I hadn't changed, I was still the asshole I'd always been. 
she would have never reached out to you because she would have figured, you're all a bunch of assholes, you can't help me. But she saw the change in me, and so she reached out to the people in AA in Milan, Italy. They took her to the meeting. There was Peter. Peter helped her. Peter came home and said she's okay. And, uh, and I saw that, and I, wow. See, there really, really is no spot where God is not. And uh, there's many, many stories like that that have happened that uh, gave me hope. Hope is a vision beyond your present circumstances. I don't care what you are or where you are. When I was new, I needed hope. I needed a vision beyond my present circumstances to reach out and grab a hold of. I needed some. I was riddled with fear. I was riddled with anger. I was a very violent uh, alcoholic. I beat a man to death with my bare hands. That's how. That's the goalpost. And uh, when I sobered up, that all changed. I couldn't lash out anymore, and all that went in inward. I'm new sober, and all that anger, I stuffed it. Bite your tongue. Put your hands in your pockets. You could hear the anger in my voice, but but I couldn't hit anybody, and I I couldn't ventilate anymore and all that went inside so here I am married to this lady I got this little girl and I'm stuffing and I'm stuffing and I'm stuffing and uh, well I have no tools I'm socially inept I, I have no tools a communication was a series of of uh, four letter words I, profanity was my native tongue I, I didn't know how to talk to anybody I, in the field uh, that I worked in was men off out in the oil fields and I I was just uh, I, I was a social leper I had no but I'm sober and so all this this vile boisterous loud violent human being is just a I'm a roly-poly man I sobered up and I'm a roly-poly I feel like a roly-poly I, I don't know you hurt my feelings and I I cried and I was sensitive and I I remember one time Sue said, asked me, she said, you're not going to wuss out on me, are you? <laughs> she loved me as a man. And, and here she's working the steps, and, and I'm just over here bleeding. I started bleeding. I'll tell you what happens to me. I'm a very physical person. I'm a physical person. And, and when I don't drink and I don't use and I stuff, I bleed. I hemorrhage. I hemorrhage. And it, <laughs> about three years sober, three and a half years sober, I was sober. I was sober. You bet your ass I'm sober. Don't ask me to greet and don't hug me. All these people are hugging me and I I get that tingling sensation and question my sexuality. And I'm bleeding. I'm hemorrhaging. I, I think the human body has about 13 pints of blood and I dropped out nine pints of blood in a period of time. I bled. And I got so weak I couldn't get up. And uh, people uh, in AA saw it happening, and they didn't really realize. I wasn't sitting around in in uh, meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous talking about bleeding, but it was obvious there was no color in my fingernails, and I, I lost all this weight. Finally, they sent a 911 ambulance over and took me to the emergency room, and they uh, put me in there and gave me nine pints of blood. The doctor told Sue, you know, you realize he didn't have enough blood in him? that if he would have sneezed, he'd had brain damage? And she said, how would we have known the difference? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'd done everything. I'd set up the chairs. I'd done the steps. I'd done the traditions. I'd been in a group rep. I'd been a world service rep. I'd been this. I sponsored people. I'd read the book. I'd, you know, put the plaques on the wall. I'd gone and got idiots and hauled them all over everywhere, and I was just <laughs> sober. And, uh, and people came to the hospital, and, and I was laying there so weak I couldn't even move, and they would come over there, AA people and Al-Anon people, and say, don't die, we love you, asshole. Don't die. You know. And I couldn't flip them off. I was too weak. And they loved me. They loved me. They loved me. They loved my wife and daughter. They loved my wife and daughter, and because they loved my wife and daughter, they were compelled to love me. And God has a funny sense of humor. And they literally loved me back to health. And uh, I got up and I 
I started going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I started working with others. I started working with others, and it was said last night, you know, just working the steps is just half measures. You got to get, you got to listen to the steps from another human being to make full circle. Full circle is necessary, and I'd done the steps and all that stuff, but I hadn't received a fifth step. And once I started receiving a fifth step, uh, I started the healing started. And I've listened to over a thousand fifth steps. I'm not a priest or some kind of a, I'm not a garbage pail, but I work with lots and lots of alcoholics. There were like 40 detox units and, and treatment centers around where I live, 20 to 40 bed treatment centers. There was adolescent wards everywhere. Uh, there was a 3,000 AA meetings in the Los Angeles basin, including Orange County, where I live. You could go to any kind of meeting you wanted to, sick or not. You could just go to those. So we would go to family meetings. We'd go do things. There was a lot of activity. There was a lot of opportunities to do things. It, uh, where I live, there's 18 million people, so to have a thousand people in a meeting is not unusual. And and they get you busy. And I needed to be busy. And I had a job, and I had a wife, and I, I had a house that was just destroyed. And uh, I had to live in that house for a number of years of sobriety to see en enough to see the damage I'd done and then to get enough self-worth to say, you know what, I'm sober. We need to move out of this and get a better house. And, and sobriety brought me that. And, and uh, through some more God stories, I was able to get the money to get a nicer house. Our daughter was friends of a, a little girl at her high school. And uh, she, uh, we went to look at this house. And here was this guy. And he had, his daughter was there. And his daughter knew my daughter. And he said, you want this house? I said, yeah. But I don't have no money. He said, I'll help you. I don't know why, but I've got the money to help, and my daughter likes your daughter. I'll help you. And they helped us. And we got, got out of that old house, the old neighborhood, and, uh, and started recovery. I had, a lot of, uh, I had a lot of wreckage from the past. As Sue mentioned, I'd been involved with criminal elements uh, uh, for a long time, part of my lifestyle. And... Uh, it took a period of time for that to catch up with me. But Sue always allowed me uh, to, to work an AA program and, and have a sponsor. I had a sponsor from the very beginning. I've always had a sponsor, still have a sponsor. And to me, a sponsor is a tool that I can use just like the steps. And, uh, and uh, I try to ask my sponsor what he thinks of what I'm going to do before I do it. That's always been the... Ask me before you do it. I'm not a magician. I can't fix it after you've done it. Talk to me about it before you do it. And that's always been the front thing up front uh, to have. And call your sponsor is the three most important words in our home. Even our daughter. You've got to have a sponsor to live here. Call your sponsor. My daughter's had the same sponsor. The same lady's been her sponsor for, I don't know, 20 some, 25, 26 years. When my daughter, when our daughter went from Alateen, and she's a little girl all beat down and everything, and uh, she'd been in all the violence in the home, and I brought all kinds of criminal element and crazy dope fiends and gang people to my house, and my daughter was afraid. She's like a wounded animal. She'd go hide. And, and uh, so when she went and made the transition, it took her a while in Alateen. When she was 19, 18, 19, she started making the transition into Al-Anon, Al and she needed to do a fifth step, a fourth and fifth step as an Al-Anon. And she went and did that with a sponsor. She got an Al-Anon sponsor. And she went and did her fourth and fifth step. And she came home and she said, uh, Dad, I need to make amends to you. She said, yeah, you know, uh, during your drinking, we had a cat, and and we lived uh, where there's uh, three seasons, so there's a cold time of the year, and we had an old gas dryer, and, and our daughter go in. We, everybody had to do their own laundry. Nobody did it, you know, with survival. And she'd go open that dryer with her clothes would be warm. That cat would jump in that dryer, and she'd sp shut the door and spin that cat. And then she'd open that door, and the cat would jump out and cling to her. It was scared to death, but it clinged to her, and she'd caress the cat. And, and she, she developed uh, a thought pattern that that cat 
loved her. That cat was scared to death. But she comforted that cat. So in, in the active disease of alcoholism, she developed this thing where when she felt unloved, unloved, you know, un, unwanted, unloved, and alone, <laughs> the cat went in the dryer. <laughs> she tortured that cat for several years until the cat learned to stay away from the dryer. But in her fifth step, she recognized that. Now, let me tell you something. One time I came off of about a 10-day run. I came home, and I blacked out. And my, The only friends my daughter had was she brought, she'd bring these stray dogs out of the neighborhood. She brought a stray dog in, and I came out of a blackout. That dog was laying on her chest, one of those stray dogs, a little cocker spaniel, all matted hair. And I killed that dog. I shot that dog nine times right on my daughter's chest. And Sue was standing five feet away. And nobody cried. Nobody showed any emotion. And I took that dead dog and threw it in a trash bag and said, Don't you love anything more than you love me? You're supposed to love me. You can't show affection to anything. I'm talking about terrorism. I'm talking about alcoholism. And she hated me for that. And so when she came to the program and started seeing that once I sobered up, I didn't torture animals anymore. Matter of fact, I had to see that I really shouldn't have any because I can't take care of them. She started forgiving me. But when she did that fifth step and saw that she'd tortured that cat, here she is, 19 years old, running around to fi- trying to find a man that will hold her like that cat. She's trying to find a relationship that's like that scared cat. Every man she goes looks for, she's looking for a man that's tortured and scared to death so she can hold and caress. It's sick. She said, Dad, that's sick. I'll never have any kind of a relationship if I look for a man that's like that cat. And you'd shoot the dog, for God's sakes. You never tortured. You, never, you didn't prolong it. I tortured the cat for years. And she said, I forgive you. Can you forgive me? And I said, absolutely. We were sick. We don't do that anymore. Don't do that anymore. That was the healing. Don't look at the fact that I killed the dog. Look at the healing. There was healing going on. Healing going on. See? The insanity of alcoholism is not, it's not what I did when I was loaded. Of course I'm crazy. It's how I change. The, the second step is about how I change once I've got clean and sober. Once I've got clean and sober. My daughter... Uh, Uh, changed from a little girl to a woman. And she was, uh, there was never any incest in her home. It was mostly violence. But if I hadn't sobered up, I have no idea what would have happened. And uh, when she started making the transition from a little girl to a woman, she was tall, skinny, big boobs, beautiful. And she brought her girlfriends over and they'd get in their bikinis and go out in the pool. And I had to leave the house. And, uh, and I didn't let her run in and jump on Daddy and let Daddy cuddle his little girl anymore. And you didn't walk around the house in your underwear. There was changes. There were some morals. See? There was morals. Where they come from, I, I don't know. I think it's just sobriety. I believe that I'm an alcoholic. I believe an alcoholic is a drunk with a conscience. I think there were periods of time when I was drunk that I would see what I was doing, and it was wrong, and I knew it was wrong. I just didn't know that I had a phenomenon of craving that made me do it again and again and again. That was the frustrating uh, dilemma. I don't want to be this way. I don't want to be this way. And uh, I don't know how to stop it. Because I have something in me that makes it necessary for me to do it again and again and again. I became so frustrated that the anger got worse. The violence got worse. And... Uh, I'm the kind of alcoholic, uh, I hear all these young guys come in AA and they talk about all their quests and all their love life. Let me tell you, if you drank with me, baby, it wasn't working no more. I was no longer a lover anywhere. And uh, I, that's the last thing that dies in a man. And as, as that died in me, I became more angry. That You ladies can fake it maybe, but boy, if it don't work, we can't fake it. And, uh, man, that part of me was just uh, made me very angry. 
I, I would go places and get hookers and just pay them a bunch of money to make me a man, and they couldn't do it, and I beat them. I was very violent about that. And, uh, and of course, at home, I was a drunk, stinking old drunk. You know, there's a lot of different kinds of al but a real al is one that slept with a drunk like me, baby. You come home, and I roll in that bed drunk, stinking, and want to make love, and it can't work, and it don't work, and I get on you because it won't work. Wake up with vomit in the bed. Say, I love you, baby. Please forgive me. <coughs> and uh, many, many times, <coughs> many times, it was ugly and violent because of that. And uh, here I am sober. <coughs> I don't know how to dance. I could dance like an old fool when I was drunk. Dance all night. If I had a little speed in me. <clears throat> and uh, now I'm sober. <clears throat> I don't know how. I was sober a while and, and uh, trying to get my <clears throat> sex relationship back. And uh, my sponsor said... How does it feel to make love to your mother? I said, what the heck are you talking about? He said, that woman's been your nurse. She's been your lawyer, your bondsman, your cook, everything but a wife. It's been like a mother. And Sue talked about us going through surrenders there. I I had to ask my wife, we were going to make love. I said, do you like what I'm doing? She said, no, I've hated it. I said, well, you've let me do it for years, for God's sake. Well, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what made her feel good. I didn't know what to say to her to make her feel good. How about just a little hug? How about a little affection? I didn't know I was a taker. I'm a taker. I'm a taker. I'm a selfish, self-centered alcoholic. I'm a taker. And... uh, I had to learn all these things. It, w- it wasn't that my fourth and fifth step was so big a deal. The best thing about my fourth and fifth step was I dropped a lot of lies. There was a lot of stuff that I thought and all this stuff that I, that dropped off when I did my fifth step. That's the good news. The bad news is what was left was really sick. But it wasn't a surprise to me. And we would do things together. The old timers told me I can't cheat on my wife. I have to stay with my wife as long as she'll let me for the rest of my life if necessary. I don't have a choice. And uh, they were very firm about that. That you've done all this stuff. You've tortured your family. Now you're going to make amends. It's the amends step. I was told in the very beginning, you need to make amends here. I said, well, I haven't even worked the first step yet. I don't care. You need to make amends here. You go home and you shut up. You don't tell her what's wrong with her. I said, if I don't tell her what's wrong with her, who's going to tell her what's wrong with her? Somebody needs to tell her what's wrong with her. And they said, it ain't going to be you. And so I'd just stuff. I'd sit there. They told me my daughter would come home from school and slam the door and come in there. And then she'd want to talk to me about her lessons and... I was mad because she slammed the door. They said, just give her five minutes of undivided attention a day. Start there. And uh, I was a disciplinarian from a distance. Sue was the mom and dad in that home when I was drinking. And I was a disciplinarian from a distance. So I didn't know how to discipline. I had tremendous guilt, tremendous guilt when I sobered up. got tremendous guilt for the things I did. In my home, with my family, much less the people outside. I owed a tremendous amount of money. I, I, I'm a mover and a shaker and a candlestick baker, baby, and I tell you what, I owed a lot of money. I had two different groups of people that had a hit on me when I sobered up. I had stolen a quarter million dollars worth of narcotics and got drunk and hid it and forgot where I hid it. So when I sobered up and I was in that detox, I didn't want to leave that detox. I felt safe in there, and I knew they weren't coming in there because it might, they might get infected. So I was safe in there. And when I got out, I go home, 
And these people find out I'm home. And I got calls saying they're going to break my daughter's leg if I don't do things for them, pay them back. I'd sit in a meeting of alcoholics and us and some guy's whining because he had a flat tire. I got people going to break my daughter's leg. I didn't say it in a meeting. I didn't say it in a meeting. I was scared to death. And I stayed sober long enough that the people that, that I was involved with in, in the organized crime found out I was sober. They knew I have certain characteristics that are really good that they could use. And if I'm sober, I'm really good at it. So all of a sudden, they get interested in me. See? And uh, I've got all that coming at me. Uh, when I was new, sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, if I got what I deserve, you better not be sitting next to me because it's going to splatter. And uh, I've got all this going on in my head. I've got all this anger, and I'm bleeding, and I'm trying to do things. And uh, they told me to write. I'm a product of pencil and paper. I had to get rid of it. Matter of fact, I couldn't even get an erection until I sat down and wrote. Get clear my head. If I didn't clear my head, I couldn't even... I couldn't even perform as a man. I learned that was the greatest tool of recovery was to sit down at that desk with that pencil and paper and get rid of my resentments, burn it out, throw it away, give it to my sponsor, then I could love my wife. You can't make love to your worst resentment, and there she is. And uh, I had to make amends. At 52 days sober, I remembered where the narcotics was. I was sitting in detox in a meeting, and I go, I know what's that. <laughs> People, what's the matter with you? Huh? Never mind. And, and Sue knew this was going on. She was going down on. She had to release me. She had to let me go. She had to. She couldn't get involved in this anymore. And I went and got the stuff and gave it back to the people, and they were glad to get it. And I found out that every good thing in my life is preceded by a wall of fear, and I got to walk through a lot of walls of fear. I have to walk through these walls of fear to get the good on the other side. When I was drinking, I drove fear like a fast car, baby. Some people hunker down in the corner like an old mule. Man, when I got that fear going, I drive it like a fast car. Here I'm sober, and fear demobilized me. It demobilized me. And uh, I had to get this stuff and give it back to these people and uh, walk away from them. They said, don't call us, we'll call you. I walked away from it. I didn't take a newcomer with me and go flush it and go do all this stuff here. No, I went and gave people something that belonged to them back to them. And I owed about $260,000. And uh, I didn't get to declare bankruptcy or say, I'm an AA. It's all okay. No, my sponsor said, pay them back their money. I said, do you realize how long that's going to take? Don't make a difference one day at a time. And Sue knew how much it was. And our old house was beat up. She started cleaning up the inside of the house and putting uh, wallpaper up and filling in all the holes in the walls and everything. And I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. And get the money back. I went and borrowed some money from a kid that I grew up with that had a lot of money. He loaned me some money, made me a deal, paid the people back, and I started working. It took me 14 years of sobriety to pay that money back with interest. I didn't have an overwhelming good feeling about it at all. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to drive up out here in a new Mercedes and say I was in a blackout and bought that car. Ha, ha, ha. But... I, 250,000 bucks I owed in a lot of different facets of life, and I had nothing to show for it. Nothing. They couldn't even brag about it because people didn't believe it. You can't possibly be that. Oh, yeah, I can. And uh, I started paying it back. It took me 14 years of sobriety to pay that back. And, and the reason I share that is simply because uh, by the time I paid it back and worked and worked, Sober, 14 years sober, I was making a lot more money than I would have been if I'd have been able to slough off the debt. I, I raised myself up to a level of income and, and, and uh, uh, profession to work to make the money to pay the debt and still take care of my family. Sue worked and she helped, but she never made any of my amends payments. 
Thank you very much. That's your problem. You pay it. I'll take care of the, me and the kid, and, and I made the house payment, and we did things. But she did it all. She set the pace. The woman sets the pace in the home. The woman sets the pace in the home. And uh, her and, and the daughter worked a program and allowed me to do these things. And I paid this money back, and I was making good enough money that we could start living a good life. And uh, we gradually changed. We gradually changed. We fell in love. We came here. We thought we were in love, and we were in heat. And, and then we just became crime partners through my dream. We became crime partners. She was a designated driver. She could drive the getaway car. If people owed me money and they were in a bar, I'd send her in the front door to get the money, and I'd wait around the back with a two before, knock the guy out, and take my money. And so we were a team. We are like the Bonnie and Clyde out there. And everywhere we went, people feared us both. We were a team of sick, sick, crazy people. And we, we had crazy people. Guys that come over to my house because they didn't want to go home and fight with their wives, so they'd come over and watch me fight with mine. She had a 12-inch butcher knife she kept within reach all the time, 24-7, and I had a 45 automatic with a rounded chamber, safety off, and the hammer back laying on the nightstand. For 15 years, we slept like that, and the, those weapons weren't for people outside of the house. And our daughter was in that. Now, I hear a lot of people, and I, I won't debate it, but I'll tell you this. A lot of people say, oh, I damaged my child and all that. Well, our, our child was damaged. She had many reasons to hate me forever. But she went to Alateen. She started prying the steps of Alateen, which are basically the same. Even though she was 12 and a half, 13, she didn't really know what she was doing. She was young enough to be intimidated. We intimidated her. You've got to do this. You don't have a choice. And she did it, and she got better. She accepted I'm an alcoholic. And I'm going to tell you something. My daughter has lived in Italy for over 20 years. She was a ramp model. She, ramp, she modeled all over the world. And nobody ever took advantage of her. She could kick their ass. My daughter got tough from that. She used her character defects of living in our home to be tough and take care of herself, self-supporting through her own contribution. There was places she'd go in foreign countries when these people, gangs and what have you, would come upon her. She'd take her high-heeled shoe off and whack them upside the head. She learned that from her mother. She's she's strong woman. A good woman. She's not a violent woman, but put in the right situation, she'd take care of herself because she was in boot camp. <laughs> One time she was in Italy and she needed a meeting. I don't know, a meeting. The only ones that had a good meeting out of the NATO base, a NATO base over in uh, part of the area there. But she had to ride a train about an hour and a half. So she'd get a couple of newcomers and they'd get on the train. And they ride this train over to this NATO base where they had a good Allen on me. And on the train was a bunch of military people from all over the world. And one night she was coming back from the Allen on me, her and a couple of little newcomers, and there was a bunch of jarheads from America on the train. Jarheads. Hammerheads. Talking crap about the girls. And they were talking in English, and they thought these girls were Italian. They didn't know that Simone could understand them. And she listened to it, and then she took her shoe off and whacked them upside the head. What are you doing? You're supposed to be Marines. You're a disgrace to your uniform the way you're talking. And they were surprised as hell because they thought she couldn't understand them. She understood everything. said, you need to straighten up you're like, like, like a jerk. <laughs> Don't mess with her. When you see her on a train, leave her alone. She's a very loving, a very good mother, a very good wife. She married an Italian. I'm telling you, you're going to marry an Italian. You better be, you better keep him uh, in a bedroom or he's gone. And she does good with that. She's kept herself up. And I've been over there many times. I go over, soon I go over, and we get to go to the Bertolotos, uh, the in laws, and they go to their house, and they're old, old Italian people, very wealthy people. And I go over and I get an audience with them and I just say, thank you for taking care of my little girl as if she were your daughter. And they say, thank you, don't worry. And then I get out of their life. But I've sat and watched my son-in-law 
with his children. I watched my son-in-law uh, with his wife. And I tell you, the, the, the greatest reward of that is that I don't have to worry about how my son-in-law treats his wife. I don't have to worry about how my son-in-law treats his children. He's a good man, a good man. And I've been in his home, and I've watched this many times. He's a good man. And even though they live halfway around the world and we don't see them very often, I don't have to worry about them. And I'll tell you something. When Simone went over there and went to Al-Anon and got it going, she met this guy, and he don't know anything about it. He's not an alcoholic. He doesn't understand it. And he said, why do you have to go to all these meetings? And she said, I just need to. She said, don't make me choose or you'll lose. And he's never made her choose. He doesn't always like it. He, he's, uh, got it. he doesn't understand it, but he's been in my home. He came over from Italy, and he's a very wealthy young man. came over from Italy the first time, and he came to our house. Our daughter brought him to our house. <clears throat> I was standing in the kitchen. I had a Rolex watch on. Prosperity had come along, and I was sober long enough to get some flash. And uh, I had this Rolex watch on. And he's looking at it. He's looking at my watch. I notice him looking at it. He had a little fanny pack on, you know. And he said to my daughter, he talked to Italian, and my daughter needed to know how much I wanted for that watch. And I didn't, I don't know what I said. I, it was probably a fair market value, but it was a little more than what I paid for it, I'm sure, because I just don't say things that are less. And he took his fanny pack out and had American money and bought that watch off my hand. And I sold it to him. And I thought, you know what? I'll never have to worry about my daughter. He, he impressed the hell out of me right there. And she's never wired home for money. Because that guy's a proud guy, and he takes care of his family. Takes care of his family. Sue and I have gone over there, and we've done many things uh, in the program over there. Sue, so our daughter started a, a woman's retreat, and they've all kinds of program things, and she has a bunch of newcomer girls over there and working with them all the time. We've been over there, gone to meetings. We've flown into Nice, France, and gone to meetings over there, what have you. Not that we're doing anything, but we've been a part of that community. And so what I'm here to tell you is that there's been healing in our family. I don't know where you are on your road or whatever, but we come from the pit of epitome of the pit of violence and anger and terrorism and uh, and just insanity. And we've come up out of that darkness. We've come up out of that darkness to a healthy family. Sue and our buddies, we get along. We, we've been retired for 10 years, and we do a lot of things. We're active. She does her program. I do mine. She has her friends. I have mine. She falls in love with me when she sees me working with a newcomer and, she, and giving of my time. Uh, She's not my sponsor, and I'm not hers, thank God. Uh, but we both have sponsors, and, and it uh, is a very important uh, tool of our recovery. Uh, our home is a program home. We have things around on the wall that are program things. Anybody comes in our home while they see these things, they, we're not ashamed of the fact that we're in the program. Matter of fact, uh, the cops haven't been to my house in a long, long time. It's been a long time since I've walked down the street at a 45-degree angle. And I'm grateful for the little things. I'm grateful the holes in my nose are turned down because they turned up and it rained, I'd drown. You know, little things like that I'm grateful for, you know. <laughs> we have friends. Sue and I have people that we've sponsored, relationships with people that we saw new that we sponsored for over 20, 30 years. Long-lasting relationships with people in the program that we've sponsored, that we've nurtured, that we've helped stand up, clean up, grow up. It's not just a relationship that her and I have. It's a relationship we've had with sponsors. We've gone through a lot of things. What did your sponsor say? Well, I don't know. What did your sponsor say? I'll tell you what my sponsor said, if you'll tell me what your sponsor said. You know, those games and what have you. And when she changed sponsors, I didn't have to. I thought there for a while, if she changed sponsors, I had to. I didn't have to. And uh, <laughs> we've had, I remember one time, 
uh, we must have had our 25th wedding anniversary. We're in the program. We had a lot of young people around us, and they were coupling up and all this stuff. And we had our 25th wedding anniversary, and these all these young people in A and Alan got together, and they they went down. And we didn't have anything. We had used furniture, used house, used car, and they they got us a cheap. It was German silver, but a cheap silver service. A platter and, a, you know, two pots and a couple of things. A cheap, but it was a silver service, 25-year anniversary. And so we were going to have a date, and we're going to dinner, and then we're going to go home, and we're going to bed. And so these young people came over to our house after we got home, and they watched the lights go out and counted to 50, and then they watched the lights go back on. You know, we were done. Yeah. There was a knock at the door, and we went to the door, and here's a hundred young people. And they got this big box, and they come in the house. And uh, we had a house, had a staircase, and, and they lined up all around us, and we opened this box, and here's this silver service. And we set this silver service down, and Sue and I are standing there. And I remember standing there looking at all these young people's eyes. And I, I, I wasn't sober long enough to have a lot of self-worth. I knew. But I'm looking in these young people's eyes, and, and they're looking at us like, and they wanted us to say something. And Sue talked, thank you and thank you. And I remember looking at their in their eyes and saying, wow, I, I don't have anything. But I knew if I'd cheated on her since I sobered up, I, the guilt would kill me standing there with those kids looking at us. If I knew if I'd cheated on her, the guilt would kill me. And standing there, I was just grateful that I hadn't cheated on her, that I hadn't beat her, that I hadn't done these things in sobriety. And and I just said, thank you. The next day, I went to my sponsor, and I said, you know, all these young people in the program came, and they looked at us in that silver service and everything, and I didn't know what to say. My sponsor said, you don't need to say anything. Do you realize you are what they want to be? You are what they want to be. I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't understand that I was a good example. That I was a good example. And uh, what a beginning. What a beginning to be a good example. I'm my best when I'm with you. I'm my best when I have a newcomer with me so that I don't act like a jerk. I'm my best when I'm with my family. I'm my best when I'm with you. And that's why I love you. Thank you. Let's talk about nothing. We had more fun talking about nothing a while ago. Hi, I'm Sue. Hi, I'm Sue, a grateful member of the Alan Family Groups. Let's talk about nothing. I had more fun talking about nothing a while ago. <laughs> All right, Keith and I would uh, like to go over. You ask us to do the 12 traditions, and uh, we've done these before. Tell them I'm not there. Phone's ringing. The thing I like about uh, the traditions. Now, Al-Anon adapted the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, but we cannot use the 12 traditions of AA. We're different. Quite a few of the traditions are different in the AA traditions than the Al-Anon traditions uh, for obvious reasons. But the thing that I like is in the the prefix for the traditions is that uh, it talks about the obedience to the unenforceable. Now, when we first got into the program, uh, my sponsor told me that the traditions were for the group and that you could use them in your family and in your home and uh, for recovery because it's for the group. So I retyped them, put them on the refrigerator and I put family everywhere that said group. And my sponsor had come over and she looked at him and she goes, you retyped the traditions. And I said, well, yeah, because we're a family. She said, we've been here a lot longer than you have and they've worked just fine. Nobody needs to retype the traditions for us. And it's, it talks about the group and the traditions. You break that word up and it says it's grow up. And that's what these people in this house are. You all need to grow up. 
So you leave the traditions the way they are. And so we did. And the first one for our common welfare should come first. Personal progress depends upon uh, unity. And we had to get well in our personal programs before we could ever come together and be unified in the home. And that's what started the progress in our home with this tradition. This tradition talks a lot about, um, it has the steps in it. It goes through there. He that learns that the clamor of desires and ambitions within him must be silenced whenever these could damage a group. So we had to get rid of our old ideas in order to be unified in our home and work on ourselves. And then we became unified. One of the things, is this thing, uh, am I hearing something? Sound like I'm talking in a 50-gallon barrel. Got it? Anyway, one of the things that uh, I've come to understand about the tradition, the, the same guy wrote the steps, wrote the tradition. Same guy wrote the steps, wrote the traditions. Basically, they're different times, but, but they, they uh, are different purposes, different motivation for Bill to uh, do the traditions, but it still came out of the same mind, and the people helped him with this. So if you have step one, uh, we, uh, you know, admitted we're powerless over alcohol, dash, our life's unmanageable, and then you come to the uh, tradition one, tradition one, you know, where is tradition one, our common welfare should come first, personal recovery depends upon AA unity. So I get sober. I admit I'm powerless over alcohol. My life's unmanageable. I go to a home group, and my home group uh, teaches me unity. And where that helped me in the home was I, how I acted in my home group helped me act good at home. And I went home, and we w- we had we had meetings that we went to together, where I could go to the AA meeting, she'd go to Al Anon meeting, the kid could go to an Alateen meeting. One night a week, we would go, we'd get in the car. We'd go over there, and we'd, we, we would go to the meeting. After the meeting, we'd get in the car, and we'd go home. So there was unity. It started out that simple. It started out as simple as we never had a meal together. Never had a meal together, and we started, okay, when can we have a meal together? When we can sit down and have a meal together as a family? And, of course, when we sit down and had a meal together, well, then we started taking each other's inventory. <laughs> So our sponsors told us that when you sit down to have a meal together and you start talking, you can have a meeting. And daddy gets to share first, and then mom or the child gets to share. But daddy don't have rebuttal. Daddy don't get to share twice. Daddy can't make comments. Daddy can share first because he's leading the meeting, and we're eating. And daddy's got to listen to mom and the child talk about their stuff, and then you're through eating and the meeting's over. And so we unified like that. We sat down and we had a meal together and we shared. But Daddy can't take everybody's inventory all during the meeting. Daddy can express himself at the meal. Thank you. Good meal. Da 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 da. And then I shut up. I don't get to talk again. So that was the unity of the first step from the, from the first step to the first tradition in our home. We're a group. We're a group. And, and you come to the group to find out. We come in here and we have personalities. We have personality defects. The greatest, the greatest sponsorship tool with the traditions in a group is to give people commitments so that their character defects come out in the group and so you can work on your character defects with the help of the group. You want to get on a committee and set up these tables and, and all these centerpieces and everything else, you're care- you'll see people's character defects that come right out while you're out there helping in the group. Yeah, you betcha. The second tradition is uh, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. And this is the tradition that dethroned Keith. He was not the ultimate authority in our house anymore. And uh, he used to, when he was drinking, we had this old TV that you had to get up and push the buttons to change channels, and he'd say, Change the channel. Neither Simone or I'd get up and we'd change the channel because we didn't want to fight. And so he gets sober and he's sitting there on the couch and he goes, I need the channel changed. 
And Simone goes, because she's been to Alateen, she goes, are your legs broken? He goes, what? She said, Dad, you're self-supporting through your own contributions, which is the seventh tradition, and now you're asking me, and you're not the authority here anymore. We have a loving God in our home. So you need to learn to do some things for yourself. We are not your trusted servants anymore. (laughs) So he gets mad. He goes out in the garage. We hear this hammering and sawing and all this stuff. He comes back in, and he has cut up two brooms and taped the handles together, and now he's laying on the stove and he's punching the TV. (laughs) And I go, great, now we have a recovery in our home. And we went through those kind of things. And is that being restored to sanity? I don't know. But he was self-supporting through his own contributions, you know. And we have so many things like that. Simone went through a period she didn't think she needed a curfew. And when Keith was out working out of town, she wouldn't come home till 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Her and I would have an argument about, I know what goes on at 2 o'clock in the morning out there. And uh, so then when Keith had come home, I'd tell him, and she'd go, I don't know what she's talking about. Because she's a teenager. She knew everything, which is a disease of its own. And uh, so she talked to us, and Keith said, I don't think she needs a curfew. You know, she's like she was a junior in high school, and she has a program, and she knows what she's doing. She's not a bad kid. And one night we was uh, laying in bed, and she was out, and there was a car wreck down at the corner, and I was jumped out of that bed, and I was at the window right now, just like I'd always been. And it's like, I'm not going through this disease twice. And so I didn't say anything. I got up the next morning, and I uh, went down to the grocery store, and I got some boxes, and I just went upstairs, and I started packing. And Keith came out, what are you doing? And I said, I'm leaving. We took a group conscience, and I'm odd man out, and, and I'm, I'm not going to go through this disease twice because if she stays out there long enough, she's going to be doing stuff that I don't want to go through with her because I went through it with you. And he said, wait a minute. And he called Simone in, and he goes, Simone, look what your mother's doing. And she goes, so? And he goes, we're not going to live like that in this house. We're in recovery. And she goes, well, we took a group conscience. And he said, but it wasn't the solution. We need to have an informed group conscience. So we need to talk to our sponsors. And then we'll come back and and discuss it again. And so she went and called her sponsor, and pretty soon she came back in. And she said, it won't be a problem. She said, when I leave this house, I'm going to tell you what time I'll be home. And then you can learn to trust me. And I said, so what if we're not home when you leave? She said, I'll leave you a note. And I don't know if she padded her times or what, but she was always home on time or early. And so it's how sponsorship and this step had uh, tradition had worked in our life. We took group consciences and we talked to sponsors and nobody governed. We talked things out and things worked that way. So there again, the uh, second step and the second tradition go hand in hand. Tradition too for our group purpose There is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. In our case, our leaders was our sponsor. The group was us. And uh, and in the second step, we, we ask some loving God to restore us to sanity. The second tradition gives us an opportunity to do that. And like I said, there were three of us. And this is my story. I don't, whatever, if you got 20 in your house, you got a, you got a lot of people. But we only had three. And there was never a time when one of us was not in, in group consciousness, in, in God consciousness. Sometimes we all three were. Sometimes two were. But you can tell whenever you're in a, in a helter skelter environment, if, if one person's in God consciousness, they stay focused. And you can't get them out of focus with that. And it was usually our daughter, usually our daughter, because like I said, when I sobered up, I'm working on a relationship with my higher power. Sue's working on a relationship with our higher power. We're working the step to get, get be restored to some kind of sanity here. And the tradition was a saving grace for our group purpose. That's us. There is but one ultimate authority. And in the second step, I said, help me. That's what I ask in the second step. I ask this ultimate authority to help me. 
So I've taken the second step. Now I have a chance to use it in the house. A loving God, as we, he may express himself in our group conscience, which means that the three of us were a group. So that was a group conscience. And sometimes we took group conscience and it was off balance. I told my daughter whenever she wanted to do that and mom was going to move, I said, look, babe, let me tell you something. Me and your mother were together before you even came to this earth. And you're going to grow up and go. And me and your mother are going to be together. So I don't care what the group conscious is. Me and mom were together before you got here. And me and mom are going to be here after you move out and go away. So it's me and mom. And that's the team. That's the group conscious. It's me and mom. We're, you can't play us against each other anymore. One night, uh, <clears throat> Keith and I decided we wanted to have an evening home by ourselves. And so we told her, you know, she was going to go somewhere in... Uh, to an outing function, then she decided she wasn't going to go and she's going to stay home. And Keith said, no, you're not. Mom and I have decided we're going to have an evening home by ourselves and you're going to go and do what you said you was going to do because we're going to be by ourselves. And so she goes, okay. And so our group, our home group, the young people in our home group were having a young people's dance, so she decided to go there. And so the next day, next morning we all got up. Simone was angry and mad and she was... You know, body language was bad. And I go, wait a minute, what's your problem? Dad and I can have some time to ourselves. And she said, I know, but you and Dad are so selfish and self-centered. You know, I came home and the light's on in the family room. And I think that you and Dad are up there fooling around. And I keep looking at my watch. And she said, you left the light on. You didn't turn the light on. I slept in my car till 5 o'clock this morning because I didn't want to walk in on you and Dad. (laughs) And so... (laughs) <laughs> no. <laughs> and I said, Simone, she goes, well, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, and the third tradition, the relatives of alcoholics when gathered together for mutual aid may call themselves an al non group. Provided that as a group they have no other affiliation, the only requirement for membership is that there be a problem of alcoholism in a relative or friend. And when we made the decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God, that came into our home. And we had made a commitment to the program of recovery, whichever program we were in, AA, Al-Anon, or al And what we had to do in our programs is that you had to have a program to live in our home. That was the only requirement for membership in our homes, that you had to have a program to live in our home. And one time Simone, her sponsor, had left the program. She didn't have a sponsor, and she wanted to go somewhere or do something. And we said, no, not until you get a sponsor. You can't do anything or go anywhere until you get a sponsor because you're running out on self-will. And so this tradition helps us to guard against the confusion that results when we allow our program to be diluted. Because if she had gone off and that, it's like when there's a third wheel and it doesn't have a program, it clicks. When you lose a clog in a wheel, every time you get there, there's a bump and it clicks. And so we wouldn't let that happen in our home. We kept this tradition going because our common problem was alcoholism, but we'd we'd all turned our life and our will over the care of God. And so we had to get back to that point in order to uh, not water this program down in in our home. It's important to understand that, uh, uh, like I say, there's a cross reference between the step and the tradition. In our case, we worked the steps, and then we got involved in the group, and then the traditions came to play. Then we came, we were secretaries of meetings, and we were doing uh, different functions, and we would go together. There was times that uh, I was chairman of some kind of an activity from the AA side. She was chairman of the activity from the Alanon side, and our daughter would be chairman of the activity from the Alateen side. So we were all working on the same uh, conference or the same get-together or, or celebration. So the, the same thing follows. The only requirement for AA membership is desire to stop drinking. That tradition falls in line with the third step. The third step, I worked the third step. God help me. Something help me. I need help. And I want to stay sober. So the third tradition in our home was to understand that Dad wanted to stay sober. Sobriety is the most important. Physical sobriety is the most important thing in our home. That tradition enforced the fact that physical sobriety. I mean, I said, don't you bring no booze in this house. There's no going to be any booze in this house. 
not going to be anything with alcohol in it. I remember one time uh, I told them, you know, no, don't bring it. And I got a cold and I was coughing and coughing and coughing and coughing and coughing. I came home, I was working, and I was coughing and coughing and coughing. I had an alcoholic cough where every time I coughed, why well, I wanted to cough again. I'm obsessed with coughing. And they went off to their meetings, and I lay down on the bed, and I'm coughing, 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 coughing. And I'm an alcoholic, and the more I cough, the worse it gets. And I jumped up. I went in her bathroom. I walked around. I opened the cabinet. There's a bottle of NyQuil down there. I picked that bottle of NyQuil up. I spun the top off it. There's a mirror there. I'm watching. I'm sober three or four years. And, I, and I'm watching me in that mirror, and I take that bottle of NyQuil, and I turn it up. There was nothing in it but a little green drop. And I watched that little green drop come right down. I got drunk on NyQuil many times. The little green drop come down there. It's coming right down the side. And my tongue's out for that little green drop. And I thought, you know what, there's a liquor store half a block away. I might as well go get me a bottle. And I put that thing down. I threw it in the trash. And I went back and laid down on that bed. And I didn't cough another cough. <laughs> and when they got home, I said... How did that NyQuil get in here? And Simone was sick, and she got it, and, and whatever, and just forgot about it. But I went right for that thing. I walked right around there. I opened that up. There was that deal. I spun the top off of it and stood there and waited. If that had been full of NyQuil, I would have had a different sobriety day. That's how fragile I am. That's how fragile I am. And I'm an old man with a lot of pain and a lot of medical problems. I'm still that fragile old man. I can go in any doctor's office. I can go anywhere, and I can get them scripts, and I'll be wandering around here bumping into the walls saying I'm sober. See it all the time. And that's what that tradition has done for me is I have family enforcement of physical sobriety. In tradition for each group should be autonomous except in the matters affecting another group or Al-Anon or AA as a whole. And You know, we'd all taken our inventory in the fourth step, and we knew who we were, and we knew how we operated, and we knew how selfish and self-centered we each were. And so when we got to this tradition, and like Keith was saying, Southern California Convention, he was the AA chairman, I was the Al-Anon chairman, and Simone was the Alateen chairman. And so he, uh, and we had an Al-Anon luncheon, and the kids uh, for Alateen had their Alateen banquet, and Keith was in charge of the AA banquet. And uh, he thought to make things simple, he ordered the same food for all three functions. Now, Simone, uh, the Alateens had taken a group inventory that they wanted hamburgers and hot dogs and that kind of stuff, and the Alanons had wanted like a chicken salad and whatever. And we didn't want the same meal three times a day. And so I called the hotel, and I called the food manager, and I said, you know, there seems to be a mistake here. And she said, no, Mr. Drum is the AA chairman. And he said, if you call, if the al chairman or the al chairman calls to change this menu, I'm the ultimate authority here. I'm in charge of this convention. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to tell you what. Not only am I the al chairman, but I am Mrs. Drum. <laughs> and the al chairman is our daughter. And so he's not going to boss us around and tell everybody what to do here. So we need to have this menu at the luncheon, and we need to have this menu at the Alateen conference. And so she said, because that decision of his was affecting Al-Anon as a whole because the committee had taken a vote on the menu, and it was affecting Alateen as a whole. And uh, so we get to the bank, we get to the convention, we sit down, and the first thing was the Al-Anon luncheon, and Keith goes... This isn't what I ordered. And we go, we know, and it's okay. <laughs> and we had to learn, even in our program, it talks about our motives. She, she told the, the head of the, of the food thing, I sleep with the AA chairman. He's going to go with chicken, no problem. <laughs> and so al and al was not affected by his decision. He might have been, but he accepted it. So we've done things like that, and it talks in here about motives. When I do something and I want to uh, make a decision, what are my motives? How am I going to affect Al-Anon or AA? How am I going to affect Keith's sobriety? The first Christmas he was sober, I went to an office party, and I hadn't drank. Uh, 
up to them from May to December, and I went to the office party, and, and I had a drink, and he went home. I had a couple of drinks, and I came home, and he said, you've been drinking. And I said, yes, I have, and I had fun, too. Well, that's one thing I, he can never do. He can never drink again and have fun. And I did something he couldn't do. And uh, he wanted to kill me. I'd wake up at night and he'd be leaning over and looking at me. And I go, what are you doing? He said, I can't decide whether to strap you to an ant den or just shoot you. He said, but whatever it is, I want you to suffer. And uh, I did an inventory. And what I found out is that alcohol had caused us so many problems in our life that uh, I didn't need it and I wasn't going to drink it anymore and it wasn't going to be in our house. And I was the enforcer in that. And uh, and then I told Keith, I said, I'm not going to drink anymore. And he goes, how can you do that? I said, because I can. Then he really got pissed off because I can just make a decision. I'm not going to drink and it's not a problem. And uh, so he had to run around with his sponsor for a couple of weeks to get over all of that. And it was good for us in our home, though, because it taught Simone that... Uh, Mom and dad are together on all of this. There's no booze in our home. If you want to drink, you can, but you can't come home if you drink. Nobody has booze on their breath. And he came. He told me, he said, I can't suck on a drunk girl's tongue and stay sober. And I said, it's not going to be a problem. you know. And so that's the tradition that got us to that point in our recovery. Tradition five. Tradition five. Well, tradition five is... Uh... I don't have them memorized. There it is, right there, Tradition 5. Each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And uh, that's a very important thing because a lot of times the alcoholic that's suffering is me. And uh, this is very important tradition. Just like the fifth step, the fourth and fifth step, we know all of the stuff about us and what have you, and we've shared it with our sponsor. But, but in this particular tradition, Tradition 5, our group has one primary purpose, dash, end of thought. And that, what is that primary purpose? Primary purpose is to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. I do that in my home group, and I pay attention. I'm very, very strong about paying attention to the uh, people with time. There's a lot of people sitting around in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings who have years of sobriety, and they're dying inside. They've got all kinds of things going on that have come up with years of sobriety, and they're dying inside. And they want to sit in meetings and act like everything's going on. And I went through that. I went through several surrenders, three years, five years, and ten years. And at ten years, I went through a complete change, occupation change, financial change. I, I had uh, a lot of uh, problems with money. I, mean, I was making $260,000 a year, and nine years sober, and... Uh, I wasn't reporting any of it, and, uh, and then I had a big change, and the next year I made 16. Now, if you've had 260000 a year coming in, and my wife and kid and everybody's you know, living on that, and then I, I have this change, and I'm making 16000 a year, that's a social shock. Money is the root of all evil. Lack of money is the root of evil. And I'm going to tell you, my daughter driving a Porsche around wanted me to pay for her insurance, wanted me to put this, that, and the other. And I said, no, we all sit down. And I said, I'm getting honest here, and I'm not going to bring that money in. I'm, I'm, I don't have the money. And I went down and traded her Porsche for a, a Volkswagen Jetta. And uh, she, she was upset about that. Uh, <laughs> But the important thing to understand in our family, what we're going through, where we're sharing to you today, today is that nine years sober, there was old timers and Alcoholics Anonymous who said, you've been running around here. I had a Rolls Royce, man. I had Rolexes and thousand dollar cowboy boots. I was high rolling, man, because I'm going to tell you something. When I got sober, my slicking and dicking was a whole lot better. I'm a mover and a shaker and a candlestick baker and I had shit going on. Let me tell you. Sober, running around the meeting, drive up out front with a Rolls Royce with a bunch of newcomers hanging out the window like dogs, and I'd buy ice cream for everybody. After I sponsored a hundred and some people, man, because I bought ice cream after the meetings and all kinds of crap. Because I had all this money. 
And I was making my financial amends and all that stuff. And boom. Boom. I didn't wake up one morning and say, I think I'll get honest. I woke up one afternoon and the FBI is at the door. And they put us all on the floor and took everything and changed my life. And uh, the Rolls Royce went away and everything went away. And uh, that's okay. All right. But I'll tell you what, sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous nine, ten years sober, my ass has fallen off. And I, I love them. Participation means I went to participation meetings, and I wouldn't be sober if it weren't for participation meetings. And they would call on me, and I'd say, I'm, I'm nine years sober. My ass has fallen off. My ass is falling off. I don't know what to do. I got to get a job. I got to go to work. I got to get a boss. And there was old timers that said, "You've been running around here with your Rolls Royce and all your little puppy dogs, your gang of ice cream eaters, and you deserve this shit, you asshole." And they turned their back on me because they were pissed off and jealous. They did. Old timers. And then there was old timers that come and said, "Come here, kid. Come go with us." We've been through these surrenders. We'll show you how to get through this, and you'll stay sober. Those old-timers grabbed me, scooped me up, and they said, Come here. Get your ass in the meeting. Get a job. They, they took me down to an unemployment office, filed for unemployment. I, I got, I'm driving a brand-new Mercedes. The payment on that Mercedes is 900 a month. I drove my sponsor down to the unemployment office in that Mercedes he said, boy, it's got nice wood on the dash here. I said, yeah, it does, $900 a month. I didn't have no job. I went in and filed for unemployment. I lied. I lied. little old gray-headed lady took my application. I lied to her. I told her they laid me off because they did away with my position. They fired me. And I come back out and... My sponsor went back with me a week later, and that little old lady, I went, he said, my sponsor sat down out there in a chair. I went in there, and that little old lady said, you can't draw on employment because you lied on your application. Oh, okay. My unemployment had only been 400 a, a month, 500 a month. They won't even make my car payment. And I go back out there, and my sponsor said, did you get it? Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I heard the pop. I lied. I'm a liar. We go out and get in that Mercedes and drive off. He says, you need to get a job. Get a job with a boss. Go to work. And that's what these old timers did for me. They took me. They put me in a place where I have to go to work. I'd have to work these traditions. I'd have to work these steps. And they saved me at 10 years sober. And some of those old timers that turned their back on me later came to me and said, you know, I was wrong. I had something I could have shared with you. But I judged you, and and uh, I was wrong. They made amends to me, but some of them didn't. And that's okay. That's okay, because there's some people here to give resentments, and some people here are here to take them. And, and I walked through that, because old-timers came and got me. They believed that 10 years of sobriety is worth saving just as much as 10 days. And that's what I'm talking about. The alcoholic who still suffers could be somebody with time. On this fifth tradition, it's my favorite of all of them because it says it's different from the AA one. Each al family group has but one purpose, to help families of alcoholics. We do this by practicing the 12 steps of AA ourselves. Now, where do you find the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous? In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't find it in al literature. Do you find the printing of the AA steps in the Al-Anon literature. So in Al-Anon, this gives us permission to go to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, in my opinion, in my sponsor's opinion, in her sponsor's opinion, in our Butus O'Neill's opinion, which is a long timer in this uh, program that gave me permission to have a step study, an Al-Anon step study, and use the Al-Anon 12 and 12 and use the AA 12 and 12 as a backup for the step study. And it has gotten me into a, a bigger depth of recovery than I would have ever found out with the al book alone. There's three challenges in this tradition. One is showing concern for others frees ourselves from bitterness, resentment, and anxiety. Two, accepting alcoholism as a disease. And three is our own serenity and spiritual growth, which takes us to the sixth tradition. Our Al-Anon family groups ought never finance 
endorse or lend our name to any outside enterprise. Lease money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary spiritual aim. Although a separate entity, we should always cooperate with Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, when Keith got in trouble with the feds, I did not interfere with that. If he was going to have to pay money back, he was going to have to pay money back. It, um, and we had to humble ourselves to live within our own means. And uh, I kept working, and I kept minding my own business. AA was taking care of him. And uh, as long as I could make the house payment and have groceries in our house, I was fine. As long as he was staying sober and he had a job and he was doing what he could to get through that federal indictment, he was fine. And that's the path we kept on, was the path of recovery, and we kept our focus um, on our primary spiritual aim. Now, what I understand today, there is no material gain until there's spiritual growth. And we've been in this program 33 years. And uh, a year ago, we got some money out of the stock market, and Keith said, you know, we're losing this money. What do you want to do with it? Where do you want to put it? And we talked about uh, we'd bought in this little house over in Vegas and fixed it up, and, and we... Um, Wanted, he wanted a nicer house, and I thought that would be good, too. And I said, you know, let's not put that in any place where we draw interest or anything. Let's take it to Vegas and buy another house. And so we got that money, and we uh, were, we was going over to Vegas, and uh, one of his friends that was a property appraisal over there called us on the way, and he said, I found this really nice house, and I'd like for you guys to look at it, and I think it would be a good deal for you. And... Uh, why don't you drive by, I'll meet you over there. And so we went over there and we looked at this house, and it's a custom home. And uh, it's beyond anything I ever thought that we could have. And it has a pool with it, and it's on a golf course, and it was unreal. And uh, houses in that area were listed for like 575 or something like that. And we made an offer on that house of 250 And this guy said, you're kidding. And I said, no, it's with Indy Bank. And they just went under. And this agent said... Uh, they got three other offers on this house, Sue. And I said, yeah, but there'll be mortgages, and we're offering cash. And he said, okay. And so he called the next day, and he said, they want your best and final offer. And I said, they got it. And he said, Sue, you don't understand. And I said, no, you don't understand. If it's meant to be, it'll happen. If it's not, it won't. That's how you know that God's in charge. It'll run smooth. He said, whatever. And he was in AA. And he called us the next day, and he said, I don't believe it, but you just bought yourself a house. And we have no house payments on it, and uh, that feels good. And uh, we have people in program over there. Last weekend, Keith was on a camp out with his home group, and some girls from California came over. And we had a step-study meeting in that house with al and AA women locally and from California. And uh, that house is a program home. It has program in it. And... Uh, Without this program and practicing these traditions and steps at our home, nothing's possible. But we practice these things, everything is possible. On self-will, nothing's possible. But working these uh, traditions and, and our primary spiritual aim is to be of service to our God and to help other people in this program. And as long as we're giving ourselves away to this program and what we have learned for fun and for free then there will be some material gain. And that's what we've, these traditions have promised us, and that's what have happened without expectations. Because when it happens, you know it's God's will because there's no struggles. If there's struggles, then we're in the self-will. Like I say, the traditions uh, coincide with the steps. So Tradition 6 in AA is AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any uh, related facility or outside enterprise, lease problems of money, property, and prestige, divert us from our primary purpose. And that's where your character defects. My character defects, my character defects flourish with money. If there's one problem I have, I mean, I, my character defect of anger is, is, comes back to anger, but it's because I'm not getting my way or I don't know what's going on. The, I come out, that's my, that's, I put that step forward. But my major character defects is money. Money. I'm a money man. I'm a money man, man. 
I make money. I've had money, 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 lots and lots and lots of money. When I was dealing drugs, I had lots and lots and lots of money. And I have been rich and poor and rich. I mean really rich and poor and rich and poor. Rich and poor. Drinking. Rich and poor. Rich and poor. And, and I'd have, you know, feast or famine. And I would have all this stuff, and then it'd all be gone. And I never gamble. I'm not a gambler, but I gambled with everything I had. Every, that's what I found out in the in the fifth step and the sixth step was that my character defect was that I gambled everything I had. We'd have all this stuff, and then boom, we wouldn't have anything. We have all this stuff, and then boom, we and I could see that in my family. So in sobriety, in sobriety. Uh, I see these things happening to my family. I see the look of my family's faith when I have this feast or family. I mean, they wanted fundraisers in AA. I raised some money, baby. Let me tell you, I raised so much money, they didn't know what the hell to do with it. They had a big fight over the fact I, I had a softball tournament. I had this. I had a raffle. I had all these things. All of a sudden, they didn't have no money. All of a sudden, they got $5,000. What are we going to do with all this money? We're going to spend it. I didn't raise it so the hell we don't spend it. We're going to throw a hell of a party. And we'd have... When I'd have my AA birthday party, we had a party. I'm telling you, we'd have 300 people. We'd have 40-foot sandwiches and ice cream for everybody, and there was shit everywhere, and give gifts away, and people brought cards paying homage to me. I'm telling you, man, I rolled it. And people hated me and jealous of me, and all, I was creating crap everywhere. See? If they didn't have no money in the group, I raised the money, give them the money. Had a raffle. Bought a thousand tickets. I was throwing it everywhere. And it's a character defect. And all of a sudden, here I am in this thing. And people are judging me. People are telling me, you need to slow down. Stop. See? And, and the seventh tradition, all of a sudden, you got the seventh. Every AA group ought to be self-supporting, declining outside contributions. I had to Quit raising money for my group. <laughs> I had people owed me money. They'd, I'd tell them I'm going to run over with my car if they didn't pay that money back. And they'd come down and walk up to the door of the meeting and hand somebody in the door and say, go put this in the basket and tell Keith I brought it. See, I had to quit doing them kind of thing. That's what got me in trouble whenever the feds come after me in sobriety is because of what I was doing before I got to AA and I bring that in here and I'm associated with all these people and they got pictures of me with all these people and here I am sober. I didn't bring it into AA. I didn't bring nobody in here. I didn't harm you. If you needed a cake, hell, I'd buy a cake. See, big time Charlie, big daddy. Big daddy had all these people. Boy, when I tell you what, when all that changed at 10 years sober, Every guy that I sponsored fired me. When they found out I went from 200,000 a year to 10, 16, see you, dude. All these guys walked, all these guys that had asked me to be their sponsor because I was big time Charlie walked away, baby. All but one guy, he's brand new. He's too stupid to know what happened. Thank God he stayed. But boy, all these people, the rats left the ship. I'm telling you, they didn't know what loyalty was. Alkies don't know what the hell loyalty is. If you're buying ice cream and cake and giving them money to take trips and going all this stuff, sure they'll ask you to be sponsor. With the seventh tradition and Alan on the self-supporting stuff came from uh, you work your own program. You know, if you make a mess, you pick up after yourself. You throw your clothes on the floor, you pick them up, and we still work that tradition in our home today. You know, and uh, you know, we work our own individual programs, and then we come together at the end of the day. We go, my favorite time with Keith is at night when we go to bed. Because we've done our thing, run our errands, we're retired, we're together a lot, but he has things to do, things to take care of during the day, and so do I. And, and, uh, and we do that, and we go to our own individual meetings at nighttime. Sometimes we go to a meeting together. But when we get at home at night and we go to bed, we lay there for a little bit and we just visit. We just visit. We had things to share with each other. It's like when we were connected at the hip and I was chasing him around all over and we was doing everything and he had to be with me right now, all that kind of, we had nothing to share. 
We had absolutely nothing to share. So that possessive, self-centered obsessiveness gave us nothing as a couple. And today we have things to share together. And like I said, nighttime is my favorite time with Keith. Um, last week, two weeks ago, he came. He went to Vegas and because I was taking a trip with some girls sharing at a conference in Hawaii, and they were having bike week in Vegas, and he went to Vegas and stayed in the house over there. And he took some alcoholics with him that stayed with him in that house. And uh, then when the weekend was over, they went back to California, and he stayed there for a week by himself. And then I stayed there that week, and I went to San Jose to another conference, and then I came back this last Monday, and I went to Vegas. And I missed that time. The time I missed him most during the week was every night when I went to bed. I didn't have anybody to talk to him. We'd call each other on the phone. Hey, babe, how was your day? You know? And we'd talk to each other on the phone for a little while at night. And he would say to me, he would say to me, baby, I miss you. Oh, my God. He used to say, get the hell away from me. And he's saying, baby, I miss you. You know? Music to my ears. I've always wanted that man to love me and care about me. And it's because of the changes with the traditions and everything. I mean, he was self-supporting for himself for one whole week, and, and I was without him for a week, and we get together, and we appreciate each other, and we love each other. And um, the eighth tradition is Alan on 12-step work should remain for ever non-professional, but our center, service centers may employ special workers. And it's like this tradition in our home, it's like uh, we're not professionals. We don't do anything. Keith has his own, uh, had his own business with motorcycles and building motorcycles, and he loved doing that. And uh, I was president of the corporation and never had an opinion on anything with that because he had sober alcoholics working for him. Yeah, and uh, I remember during the drinking days, he, I got a bill from the IRS for $50,000. And I said, wait a minute, I haven't made the kind of money where I owe $50,000 in taxes. This is your deal. And he said, well, if you can't use your wife's Social Security number, what in the hell good is she? And that was during the drinking days, and those are the kind of games we played. And I looked at him, and I said, look, you're going to pay this bill. He goes, well, it's in your name. And I said, no, I know some of your friends, and for 500 bucks, I can have a hit put on your ass. I'm not paying that bill. I'm going to jail and you're dying. But if you pay that bill, you get to live. And uh, that's the kind of games we played before we got this program. We don't do that anymore. In fact, we don't even have bills the IRS anymore. You know, we made all of our men's in that area too. And uh, we have a tax man that loves alcoholics, and he helps us get through things. When we went through all that stuff with the feds, that was a time when Keith had a lot of money, and they were wanting some of that money. And our tax man said, you need to make an investment. And we sold our old house and bought a new house, and people were saying, I heard you had to sell your house. Yeah, well, we bought a house in Yorba Linda up in the hills, and, you know, it was great because we didn't have to lose our home. We had to make right business decisions. And with the tax man that we have and Keith being a money man in recovery, he's become smarter with how to invest his money. And uh, we don't hang out financially anymore. We work together. And he tells me where the money is. It's like we used to watch The Sopranos and we'd see Tony out there hiding money in the dog food bin. And I understood that. It's like, where do you find the money if he's gone? <laughs> you know? And today I don't have those problems. There's a lot of things that uh, we've had to uh, uh, grow and change, but money, money is was a big thing in our family. Mm-hmm. My daughter just expected, you know, take care of me, Dad. And once I sobered up, it's like all the guilt, you know, I had to buy guilt gifts. And uh, I tried to do that. I spent a lot of money trying to buy guilt off, and that don't work. That don't work. And uh, I enjoyed giving them gifts, and I could. And... Uh, one of the things about the seventh and eighth tradition is uh, uh, self-supporting and change in the home. When she'd bring women over to the house, the, the newcomers, to bring them over to the house, I had to learn to not treat them like they were barmaids or strippers. I had to change in the home. 
and we would bring people over to our house. We would, we got to where in early sobriety, uh, we had a big home, and we'd bring people over at Thanksgiving. There'd be 150 people at our house eating. I'd buy all these turkeys, and everybody, every bum in town that was went to a meeting, come to our house, be 150 people over there eating Thanksgiving, lined up out in the street, coming through the house, getting turkeys and everything. People come to our house. Christmas time, there'd be 100 people over there Christmas Day eating turkeys and stuff. I bought all this stuff and fed all these people coming to my house, and they'd be all over the house, all over the neighborhood, parking their cars on the neighbor's lawn. You know, I didn't give a damn about my neighbors. The cops had been there before. Now, all of a sudden, I'm sober, and I got 100 alcoholics wandering around out in the street with a plate of dressing and turkey and asking people, what are you doing? I mean, I, I wasn't any different sober than I was drunk. See? I had no respect for my neighbors and all this crap going on around the neighborhood. I just had a bunch of alcoholics. I'd look in the backyard, and there'd be all these alcoholics in the backyard, rapists, perverts, weirdos. Every damn thing you could think of that was in AA was out in my backyard eating Thanksgiving dinner, parked all over the neighbors, couldn't get out of their driveway. And I had to recognize, utilizing these traditions, is that, you know, look, I'm not a step house. This isn't a... Uh, a halfway house. I, I have to have respect for my neighbors and other people and respect for my home and respect for the privacy of my wife and daughter and, and take care of this. I, I'm not Big Daddy. I had to shut that down. And uh, because I'm going to get resentful and I'm going to get drunk at you because you don't respect it. You're not paying back. You ain't. I, if, I need had entitlement. You know, the 4th of July, I better get four invitations to these other people's house. You were over my house on Thanksgiving, and that's this tradition here, see? I'm not a service center. I'm not a special employee. I need to take care of my family. I need to take care of my family. I need to show my family respect. And sure enough, it, by little by little, we went and got a hall like this, and Thanksgiving we'd have a thing like this, and people could come. And people brought food. They had potlucks. They were self-supporting through their own contribution. And I had to see, like the eight tradition and the eight step, the eight tradition with the group when I'm bringing all these bums in to eat at my house and they're parking their cars everywhere and causing chaos in the neighborhood. I owe amends. I owe amends. And, and I'm not responsible for all that, see? And I had to, I had to change. All that had to change. And this tradition helped me. Uh, freely you give, freely you receive. And, and I had to see that when, when a newcomer got sober and got him a new car, I had to be glad he got a new car. And say, come get me and I'll go to a meeting with you. When, when I, people wanted to invite us over at their house to reciprocate, we'd go over to their house. See? And that, so thank you for inviting us to your house. The eighth tradition, the eighth step is part of the amend. Changing as part of that seventh tradition is the financial uh, stability so that my family isn't feast or famine, where I got a hundred bucks or nothing. See? And the same state thing with the ninth tradition is just like the ninth step. The ninth tradition, if you, if you uh, co-mingle it, tradition nine, AA such ought never be organized, but we may have create service boards or committees directly responsible for those they serve. The first thing I had to recognize in my family is it takes her longer to get ready to go to a meeting than it does me. <laughs> and I might be ready to leave after the meeting before she is. And I was outside. Here I am again. Honk, 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 honk. Just like I was when I was drunk. When I was drunk, I'd go out and get in the car. Honk, honk, honk. And I'd get drunk in the car. And time was time to go. I'm laying out there passed out in the car. And here I am sober, we're going to go, honk. And I finally said, you know what, I'll take my car. You can take your car. And we'd go, we'd be there, we'd walk in, we'd sit down, we'd be together. If she wanted to leave, go ahead, I'd say. We became self-supporting. But the amends was that I quit doing that stuff, or that behavior, that drunken behavior, drunken behavior. And Tradition 9 is what, what we're not organized. I don't expect us to be organized. I go to an AA thing and all these alcoholics are fighting about something in the group and they're fighting and fighting and fighting. The meeting's over. They go outside and they're all hugging each other saying, I'll see you next week, Charlie. See? And the same thing at our home. 
I can't expect this to change overnight. And, uh, and the point is to get to the meeting and do our commitments. This tradition is the same for the al in uh, according to the wishes of the group and in line with our traditions, according to wishes in the group, we had to become willing to say, what do you think about this? You know, and get um, three opinions on what we think about this and to get organized to who's going to do what. This is the tradition that got me to throw away my scorecard. I used to keep track of what I did and what he did and what Simone did, and everybody better shape up and, and, and fit up to my expectations of whatever was on that list. And so this is the tradition that I got rid of the scorecard. I don't keep score anymore. If uh, Keith fixes dinner, you know, great, it doesn't mean that I have to fix it twice or whatever. And uh, the thing about Keith that um, after he got sober and I fixed dinner, he always helped clean up the table afterwards and put things away, which helped. You know, and we both chip in on, on the cleanup part. And, uh, and Simone started doing that. And uh, I had to ask Simone in the very beginning. Uh, my sponsor said, don't tell her, ask her if she will do things. And because uh, she has choices. And it's not the the parent talking to the kid anymore. It's like we are human beings in this house. And so I'd tell Simone, you know, do you think you could do the dishes tonight? And she'd say, yes, I can. And I'd have to say, well, okay, great. What time do you think that you will have them done? And she would always say, 10 o'clock. Well, it's like 7 o'clock or 6.30, and we're getting ready to go to a meeting. I want the dishes done before we go to a meeting. And she and I'd ask her. She'd said yes, and she said by 10 o'clock. And we'd leave. And we'd go to our meeting. We'd go home, and we'd get ready for bed. And the dishes are there. And at five till 10, she'd go in and she'd wash the dishes. And it's like I had to start. And by doing that, we started having trust and faith in each other. And it got Simone and I into recovery together. And it's like if I'm going to do this, it talks about in the al book about qualified leadership. And I was taught that the woman sets the pace in the home. If I want people to do things in the home, I have to be willing to do it myself or to be an example of recovery and do it myself and then let go of who does what. And if they want to do it, they can. And, uh, you know, i got to let it begin with me. Tradition 10, an al family group has no opinion on outside issues. Hence, our name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Now, as we've gone through surrenders in this program, people say we talk about others in this program with loving concern. Well, you can say whatever you want to about it, but bottom line, it's gossip. And uh, we were on the gossip list with some of the greats. <laughs> and I told Keith when we went through our 10-year surrender and people were talking about us, I said, well, at least they've included us with the people that are up there on the pedestals because a bunch of them are falling off at the same time. And uh, at least they're thinking about us, you know. And they're saying you're losing your home and all that kind of stuff. And, and we weren't. They didn't know the whole truth. And so I and I had a friend that I'd come into Al-Anon with, and when her and I would talk together, we took everybody else's inventory. And my sponsor put me on a two-year space from her because she said you can't talk to her without gossiping. And you've got to break that pattern. So I told her, I said, I can't talk to you for two years because you and I gossip about everybody. And so she said, okay. And so now her and I are friends and we talk to each other. And, uh, you know, she has longevity in the program and she knows everybody. And uh, the only time we talk to you about anybody else is that she'll call me and, and tell me that she's heard somebody, one of our mutual friends, pass away in the program. And she does it so often anymore that I told her here a while back, I said, when you die, you are the only person I want to call me and tell me you're dead. You know, <laughs> so we do those kinds of things. So we have no opinions. And when we was going through stuff, um, and I tell people, if they want to share something with me and say, what do you think? I said, I don't know. I'm working the 10th tradition. I don't have an opinion. That's an outside issue. Because whatever you do in your personal life is your business. Whatever you do that affects my home group is my business. Whatever you do that affects my family is my business. But whatever you do to yourself, uh, that's between you and your God and your sponsor. 
And so I don't go there with people anymore. I really love the tent tradition because that really is the tradition that bridges the gap. And, and uh, it's just like the tent step. You review the tent step and uh, promptly make amends and go, get on with it. And Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name will never be drawn into public controversy. And uh, there's a lot of, I have a lot of experiences with this type of thing. Uh, but Tradition 10, when I've gone through my surrenders, people gossip about you and people talk stuff about you, and it's just simple. And it's none of my business. I need to practice the Tenth Tradition and live and let live, and uh, there, there is a tradition there that, uh, that offers that. And uh, I love that tradition because it's, it's the, uh, the stopgap on any crap that goes on with people, you know, divorces. I'm talking about divorces and all kinds of things, inner uh, relationships and what have you, and people get involved in those things. And, and Alcoholics Anonymous, why this tradition is, you know, keep it outside the group. The same, t- the same thing when we're sitting at home as a family and we're all going to meetings and we know all the same people, we don't sit at home and gossip about all these people in our house. And uh, we had to learn that what went on in the meetings was, was the individual's uh, uh, personal relationship. And that tent tradition is what, you know, we're not going to, because Simona go to Alateen and the Alateens would be talking about what mommy and daddy are doing or mommy's doing or daddy's doing that's in AA or Al-Anon, and the kids are talking about it. And so Simone had privy to a lot of information that the kids were talking about the adults didn't know about yet. It hadn't exploded over there yet. But the kids knew it, or mommy and daddy's chipping and drinking a little bit here and there and saying they're not. All that kind of stuff we had to stop, and this tradition stopped that. It's just like the tenth step. This is the tenth tradition, and tenth tradition applying in our life stopped all that stuff. What you do outside of, you know, that's fine. Just don't bring it into the meetings. And I had to learn that too. What surrenders I went through with my personal life I don't bring it into the meetings. I don't go into a meeting and run out all my crap about my personal life. I have a sponsor that I talk to about that, and I go to meetings and I say, I'm going through something. How can I talk about something I'm going through? I'm not through it yet. I'm not through it yet. You can't talk about a surrender until you're on the other side of it. You can say, I'm in pain. You can say, I'm confused. You can say, I don't know what's going on. I'm frustrated, I'm angry, whatever, but I have a sponsor and I'm going to work the steps and I'm going to apply it and I'm going to get through it. That's what the newcomers want to hear. Can you do this and get through it? And that's what this tradition greases the skid. I'm going to get through it. Just like the 11th tradition is like the 11th step. Tradition 11, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. That When I was talking about buying ice cream for everybody, I was promoting me. And I was wrong. I was sober doing exactly the same thing that I was doing out there drunk. And so I had to shape up. I had to blend. I had to blend. And I found out that there's certain people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't hang around with the golfers. I hang around with the bikers and the bad boys and the bent fenders and the shitheads. I tell my wife, you know that guy came over and started talking to me and and he's crazy. He's a nutcase. He's a bent fender. She, I said, why does he come to me? And she goes, duh, duh, look at yourself. You're attracted. That's who you help. That's the program of identity. And what I had to recognize is that I, you know, I've, never, I've never done anything on the radio. I've never done anything. One time I was telling somebody they wanted me to do a, they wanted me to do a D, uh, one of them uh, DVDs so they could play it in the penitentiary. And they wanted to film me. And they wanted to set up a, a phony thing, phony audience, and they wanted to have a laugh machine and all that stuff. And they wanted me to get up at the podium, and they're going to put a camera on, and they're going to film me tell my story, and they were going to show it in the penitentiary. And I went to my sponsor. I didn't see nothing wrong with that. I'll tell my story. I went to my sponsor, and I said, what do you think of this? And he said, you know, Keith, the thing that's going to kill you is the makeup. So when they fix you all up and powder you up and put lipstick on your lips and all that stuff, you're going to have to perform in front of that camera, and that's what's going to kill you. Not violating the tradition. What's going to kill you is performing 
And I went and told him I can't do it. And I've never worked in the field. I've never done anything like that. I'm just in a trench. I'm down in the trench with bent fenders and alcoholics, and I, and I carry that tradition, and I don't promote it. Anyway, I just remember, remember in good standing of my home group and of Alcoholics Anonymous. In this tradition of Al-Anon, uh, you know, it talks about this is the tradition that gives security to the insecure, and it gives humility to the insecure. It's attraction rather than promotion, be an example in your own home and your own group. And uh, I did a woman's conference. I was recommended one time to do a woman's conference in Anaheim at the convention center. It was put on by the governor, and I was asked to do public information regard to al group and let all these women and professional women that came uh, know what al was all about. And so I was on the panel, and I really didn't pay attention to who I was with. And when I got there, I was on the panel with the president of MAD and a president for a lady that was trying to start uh, the three strikes program for prisoners in California. And so they had me on the program first, and I shared how I loved an alcoholic and uh, things that I basically told my story. And the other two women crucified the hell out of me like I was stupid for staying in there and that this program's helped me accept the unacceptable and he should be in prison. And, oh, my God, it was horrible. So that afternoon we were on another panel doing the same thing. And uh, I said, I'm not sharing unless I can go last And they go, wait, you can't change the program. And I said, yeah, I can. And I said, I will share on this panel if I can go last, but I am not going to go first and let these women crucify me again. And so they said, well, ask the other women. And so I told them, I said, do you mind if I go last? And they go, well, no, it really doesn't matter to us. And I said, great. So when they got through, I said, that's the kind of person I love. This is a disease and it's called alcoholism. And I talked to him from a totally different perspective of how these people don't mean to be who they are and do what they do. It's a disease called alcoholism. And it was a great experience in the end. And I had a lot of women come up to me, how do you find out about this deal? And I was on, um, they had a health day outside the county jail one Sunday, and, and they had booths for these different health things set up and and we had our Al-Anon booth there and this guy came out of the jail and he walked over to our Al-Anon table and he picked up our pamphlet Freedom from Despair and he said to me if I go to this king can you promise me this and I said absolutely and he said how can you do that and I said because I have been where you're at and that's the answer to this whole program I have been where you're at. How many times did I go down to that jail and, try, and bail Keith out? You know, and, uh, so it's an attraction. It's not promotion. The 12th uh, tradition, anonymity, is the spiritual foundation of all these traditions, ever reminding us to place principles above personalities. I cannot break my own anonymity unless I have the approval of Keith to do so first. And Keith doesn't have a problem with that, and uh, Simone doesn't have a problem with that. Uh, in her program in Italy, because her husband's family is not in the program and they don't understand the disease of alcoholism, she does not break her anonymity with her uh, married name. And in Italy, most women, when they get married, they still go by their maiden name, and Simone does that in all of her public information works in Italy. So it's not a reflection of the Bertolotto family because they're not involved in alcoholism at all. And things that I've written in this book on this tradition over the years and working with the long timers in this program, working with me and when they talk to me, I make notes. And his principles are a code of conduct to live by. Principles are more important than the individuals. It's like I cannot make a friend and they start breaking the principles of this program and they... And they want to still be my friend. I hang out with the winners. And if you don't want to practice these principles in your affairs, that's your business. But I won't go down the chute with you. You know, I will walk away because I walk on the sunny side of the street. 
Principles are revealed through personalities. God uses people to help other people. Principles never change. Personalities always do. Sometimes people change for the better, and sometimes they change for the worse, and sometimes they just stay like they are. And I want to be with the people that are getting better in this program, and they're trying to move on and change. And they encourage me to do the same thing. Listen to the message and not the person. Sometimes I really have to practice that in a meeting because you know Sally's going to bitch and moan and groan about him again. But Sally needs help. And so I talk to her on a one-one after the meeting and say, baby, it's going to be okay. Have you tried this? Have you talked to your sponsor about this? People will fail us. Principles never will. If I stick with these principles, I will always have hope in my life. And one thing that I try to live by in uh, my life today and one of the principles I live by is, uh, you know, if I'm right, I don't have to defend myself, and if I'm wrong, I can't. So there's no debate on what's going on in my life today. It's like if I'm wrong, then I just shut up and, okay, fine, no problem. You know? And if I'm right, I don't have to convince you of that either. There's only two things that will happen to me that mess me up in my life today, when I get my way and when I don't get my way. And uh, I have to turn to God to uh, turn all those things around in my life. And I am so grateful that uh, you all have come and ask us to come and be a part of your life this weekend and ask us to share. Because Keith and I have just gone through the steps. We've gone through the traditions with you. And what that does to us, it's like, you know, Keith talked about we only take the last three steps of this program on a daily basis in our life now because we've been through the last nine. But when we are asked to do this with people, it renews all of this. Just like taking a newcomer through the steps, it renews the steps for me. And I know that I'm not well and that I got keep coming back too. So thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.